to call the February 25th, 2020 meeting of the Marine Resources Commission to order. At this time, if you would please stand for the invocation led by Mr. Ed Tankard, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Mr. Wayne Franz. Lord, let us pray. We give thanks that we meet today. In these days after George Washington's birthday, remind us of his legacy of democracy, service, and dedication to the rule of law. We ask that our deliber deliberations be honest and forthright. All of our Commonwealth citizens will be treated with dignity, respect, and fairness. For this we pray. Amen. 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 Return and face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, gentlemen. Again, welcome to the Marine Resources Commission. First item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Are there any additions, corrections, or deletions to the agenda by members of the commission or by staff? There are seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion. Motion to accept, gentlemen. Motion made by Mr. Francis. Is there a second? Second. Second by, is that Mr. Zedrin? Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Also, let the record reflect that we do have a quorum. <coughs> Next item on the agenda are minutes of the previous meeting. You've had an opportunity to review the minutes of the previous meeting. Bless you. Are there any additions, corrections, or deletions to the minutes by members of the commission or staff? <coughs> Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion. I move we approve minutes as presented. Motion made by Mr. Zedrin, seconded by Mr. Tankard. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. At this time, I'd like to swear in members of staff and members of the Virginia Institute of Marine Science may be testifying today. Do you solemnly swear the testimony that you'll give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you very much. This time, we'll take permits, projects over $500,000 with no objections and with staff recommendation for approval. Good morning, Mr. Watkinson. Yes, sir. Commissioner Bowman, associate members. Uh, we have three, what we've referred to as page two items today. We have subjected these projects to our standard public interest review. There have been no objections, and staff is recommending approval, approval with the appropriate conditions that I'll mention for the projects. With that, I'll read the description for each of the projects. Um, item 2A, Fairfax County Department of Wastewater Design and Construction. Request authorization to install by the open cut trench method, a 12 inch diameter ductile iron gravity sewer transmission line, an average of six feet beneath Little Hunting Creek between the Stafford Landing at Woodland Park subdivisions in Fairfax County. In this case, the sewer line will also be supported by a series of submerged pilings drive rated into the trench once it's opened. Approximately 20 feet linear feet of the line will be encased in a 24 inch diameter galvanized steel casing and will rest on the creek bottom to maintain positive grade at its, as it crosses the creek channel. In this case, all in-stream work will be conducted within coffer dams and no in-stream work will be conducted from February 15 through June 30 of any year to protect anadromous fish species. Mm -hmm. Item 2B, the City of Virginia Beach, request authorization to modify an existing commission dredging permit to include an additional 16,000 cubic yards of state-owned submerged bottom in an attempt to expand the Crab Creek Municipal Channel adjacent to the existing Wharf bulkhead serving the Lynnhaven Beach and boat ramp facility in Virginia Beach. The expanded channel will be mechanically or hydraulically dredged down to a maximum depth of minus eight feet mean low water and the dredged spoils will be offloaded at the existing facility and utilized, by, uh, utilized for city beach nourishment. Uh, dredging of this additional area will include a one-time time of year restriction precluding dredging from May through September to protect juvenile flounder. Item 2C, the City of Portsmouth requests authorization to repair and replace approximately 1,800 linear feet of bulkhead and boardwalk, a maximum of 3.8 feet channel of the existing bulkhead with eight mooring, eight mooring dolphins along the southern branch of the Elizabeth River paralleling Water Street from King Street to Tidewater Yachts properties in the city of Portsmouth. Be glad to try and answer any questions you might have. Any questions by members of the commission for Mr. Watkinson? Thank you, Tony. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to be heard on these matters for or against? 
Seeing none, the matter is before the Commission for action. Move to approve, approve page two item. Motion made by Mr. Tanker to approve the page two items. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Ballard. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Page three items. Mr. Watkinson. Yes, sir, Commissioner, we have two. We'll take these at one at a time. Two page three items. These are consent <coughs> agenda items uh, involving uh, unau previously unauthorized work uh, where we have gone through our public interest review uh, and as a result of that review are recommended action by the commission to approve the projects but with the appropriate civil charges. The first item on the agenda was Pine Point Community Association Incorporated. Uh, they're requesting after the fact authorization to retain a 78 foot long by six foot wide timber replacement community pier extending 60 feet channel of mean low water adjacent to properties situated along Cod Creek in North Upland County. In this case, some 30 years ago in 1990, we issued a permit for the uh, pier and boat ramp replacement project. Uh, subsequently, in 2015, they got a permit to uh, replace that again. Uh, but in 2018, uh, Tropical Storm Michael destroyed uh, the facility, the pier facilities at that site. Uh, they went in and, and rebuilt that at the time. However, the dimensions of the pier exceeded what the previous permit had authorized. And as a result, uh, it was a violation. Uh, we met with both the uh, association president and the contractor responsible for doing the work. Uh, like I said earlier, we went through our public interest review, no objections. The amount of the encroachment was reasonable relative to the size of the pot ramp and other uh, structures in the vicinity. So we will recommend an approval of the project with a one-time civil charge for both the <coughs> applicants, the association, and the contractor at a rate of $1,000, and then as well as triple permit fees and royalties uh, for the association in order to issue the permit. So with that, uh, we would recommend approval of the project, uh, noting the acceptance of the civil charges that have been proffered by both the contractor and the applicant. Any questions of Mr. Watkinson? Has the contractor, was the contractor here and the applicant The contractor here? could not be here, but he submitted a written statement agreeing to the civil charge and then actually submitted his check for the civil charge of $1,000 if that's accepted by the commission. How about the applicant? The applicant is represented here today, as I understand. Okay, is the applicant present? Sir, could you come forward, please? Good morning, sir. Good morning. Did you raise your right hand? You saw and swear the testimony you give today would be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. I did. Just come before the podium, if you would, please. Could you state your name for the record, please? Robert McDaniel. Thank you, Mr. McDaniel. You've heard Mr. Watkinson indicate that you've agreed to a $1,000 civil charge in this matter. Is that true and accurate? That's correct. Okay. Any questions of the gentleman by members of the commission? Anything else you'd like to say? No, it's a pretty accurate assessment. Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Anyone else in this wish to be heard in this matter? If not, the matter is before the Commission for Action. Move to approve this page three item. Motion made by Mr. Tanker to approve page three item 19-0834 with the civil charges as presented. Is there a second? Second by Mr. France. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Mr. Watkinson, next item. The second uh, consent agenda item is for J. Scott Finney, uh, requesting authorization <coughs> to retain a six foot wide open pile private pier with 601 square feet of deck space and a 15 foot by 35 foot open sided boathouse and to install two five foot by 32 foot long finger piers and a boat lift along the Ware River at 740 Ware Creek Road in Gloucester County. Uh, in this case, the applicant has agreed to a $1,000 civil charge, and, and also that would include triple permit fees and in lieu of further enforcement action. In this situation, uh, back in the mid-90s, uh, Mr. Finney applied for a uh, private pier at the site. Uh, it was authorized by statute, recognized to be authorized by statute at the time, um, and the pier was built. However, um, sometime after 2003, uh, finger piers were added to the pier, uh, they were six feet wide rather than the authorized five foot wide. Now 2003 is the important date here in that the code changed in 2003 to stipulate the size a pier could be 
uh, before a permit would be required. Uh, you can have 400 square feet of deck space um, now without having to get a permit, and you can have finger piers, but they cannot exceed five feet in width. In this case, the finger piers were wider than the five feet, and as a result, that had to be added to the overall square footage of the deck space at the pier, and that brought it over 400 square feet. So what happened after 2003 was essentially a violation, did not get a permit from us. This came to light as a result of an application Mr. Finney submitted for the new work here. Uh, we run through the public interest review for the additional work. Uh, we don't think it's uh, excessive in this particular instance. And as a result, uh, we would recommend approval of the project um, as it exceeds the 400 square foot uh, amount stipulated in code for a private peer, but accept the offer of $1,000 civil charge payment in lieu of any further enforcement action. Uh, be, ha be happy to try and answer any questions that you might questions have. Questions of Mr. Watkinson by members of the commission. Mr. Watkinson, during the course of the discussion with the gentleman, was there any indication that he knew that the six feet were not allowed versus the five feet? I, I don't know for sure. I'm going to have to ask my staff uh, what they might have uh, learned from the is Mr. Finney, is Mr. Finney present? Mr. Finney's agent is here today okay. uh, to represent him. Um, but I can ask Mike Johnson, who uh, handled this, whether he had any indication from the applicant what he might have known about the rules. Mr. Johnson, you've been previously this morning. Could you please answer that, if you would, please? Yes, sir. In my discussions with Mr. Finney, he was unaware that the addition of those finger piers would have required a permit. Um, I think that's probably based upon his assumption he didn't need a permit for the pier back in 1996. For the questions of the gentleman. Thank you, sir. <coughs> the agent present, represented, wishes to be heard. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Raise your hand. Solomon, swear the testimony that you're about to give be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. I do. Could you state your name for the record, please? Carla Havens with Mid-Atlantic Resource Consulting, 1095 Cherry Row Lane, Plainview, Virginia, 23156. Good morning, Ms. Havens. Um, you've heard the testimony by Mr. Johnson. Can you elect to elaborate as to whether <coughs> what, what you know about the finger piers, if anything? I don't know anything about it. I was uh, hired to complete an application for the two okay. proposed finger piers and that's when it came to light when Mike came out that um, there was excessive decking out there. Okay. Any questions of the, of the gentlelady? Thank you, ma'am. Matters before the commission for discussion and action. Mr. Tanker? I'll move to approve this, this page, uh, three item as well, 19-2008. There a second to the motion? Second. Second by Mr. Minor. Further discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you all very much. Item number four, closed meeting for consultation with or briefing by council. Any need for that, Ms. Block? No, sir. Thank you. Next item is James River Association, 19-1896. Good morning. Good morning. Turkey Island Creek. I go over it <laughs> probably 100 times a year going back and forth to Richmond on Route 5, right? I get to see what it looks like now. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so the James River Association is requesting authorization to construct a 40 foot by 16 foot geogrid canoe launch at their property adjacent to Turkey Island Creek in Henrico County. And this project requires a tidal wetlands permit, so you will be acting as the wetlands board. Here's the location of the property where the canoe launch will be placed. Um, it is off of Turkey Island Creek, which is a tributary to the James River. <coughs> this is a drawing showing the property. Uh, it's currently a forested area with a uh, gravel road leading down to Turkey Island Creek. Um, 
and there, it's currently used for um, canoeing and access to the water, um, but would like to be improved for larger access to the public um, and to reduce the sediment that is falling into the river when canoes and kayaks are launched. This drawing shows the impacts to the tidal wetland areas. The red area in the drawing is the impacts to non-vegetated wetlands. And then the area in the black is for vegetated wetlands, which is about 116 square feet. This is a cross-section view. Uh, in order to place the geogrid, uh, they will have to excavate and grade into the wetland area. Um, but all impacts will be above mean low water and will only be impacting the wetland area. Here is a photo from the site where the canoe launch will be placed. Um, as you can see, there is um, some vegetated wetland area as well as non-vegetated. Here's another view. And here is an image showing the vegetated wetland area staked out. This is an image of what the geogrid will look like. Uh, this project will not have the riprap along the side. It will just be the geogrid that you see in the middle there to create the canoe launch. The existing tidal wetland area will be excavated to facilitate construction of the geogrid structure, resulting in a loss of 116 square feet of tidal vegetated wetlands. The vegetated wetlands will be compensated for at the new Mill Creek Tidal Wetlands Mitigation Bank in the city of Chesapeake. Staff commends the applicant's desire to improve public access and reduce sediment loads to the subject waterway. We believe that the applicant has minimized wetland impacts to the greatest extent possible and find that the proposed compensation through the purchase of credits at a Tidal Wetlands Mitigation Bank fulfills the Commission's wetland mitigation compensation policy and supplemental guidelines. Therefore, after evaluating the merits of the project and considering all of the factors contained in 28.2-1302-10B of the Code of Virginia and the Wetlands Mitigation Compensation Policy and Supplemental Guidelines, staff recommends approval of the project as proposed conditioned upon the purchase of wetland credits at the New Mill Creek Tidal Mitigation Bank necessary to replace the loss of 116 square feet of tidal vegetated wetlands. Now I'll take any questions at this time. Questions about members of the commission, Mr. Zadron. The uh, geo grid is it? What are, what are those things? Is that some kind of uh, uh, rubber or what is, <laughs> what is it? You know. Um, I believe that the applicant or agent would have more information on the material that the geo grid is constructed of. If you like them to come up. We'll get them up. Yeah, I think it's a composite type rubber, plastic type thing. For the questions. Just for the record, I think under the answer, but the, the question comes up where we try to, when we do mitigation, we try to ensure that the compensation is in as close proximity to the, uh, to the wetlands that, that are impacted. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, the um, New Mill Creek Tidal Mitigation Bank in Chesapeake services the James River watershed, and it is the closest tidal mitigation bank to this uh, project location. Thank you. For the questions? Thank you. Is the applicant present or represented? <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Did you your right hand? You tell us where the testimony you give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Can you state your name and who you represent, please? I'm Rebecca Napier with Wetland Studies and Solutions. I am the agent representing the applicant. Okay. Can you answer Mr. Zedrin's question about the, uh, the, the, the material proposed? Yeah. I unfortunately, we did not do the engineering port, so I unfortunately don't know the specific material used. Um, I know in the past um, they'll either be a concrete or some sort of composite type of, of grid used for that. Staff got an idea on that? Anyone? I know it varies, but depending on what they use, some of them are interlocking blocks. I've seen some that are look to be plastic, some to be a comp mixture of plastic rubber type thing that conforms to the topography of the of the property that goes in. I do know that the one It's skid is what it is, basically. The one that is pictured is the, the same product that is being proposed. Further questions? Thank you, ma'am. 
Thank you. Anyone else here in support of this project? Anyone here in opposition to the project? They're seeing none. The matter's before the commission for action. Mr. Zedrin. I move to approve the as presented. Motion made by Mr. Zedrin to approve as presented. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Minor. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is the YMCA of South Hampton Roads. Mr. Badger, good morning. Good morning. YMCA is requesting authorization to install two offshore stone breakwaters totaling approximately 676 linear feet and extend an existing breakwater approximately 30 feet, install a 100 foot long by 24 foot or 24 inch uh, diameter storm, stormwater eyefall pipe and nourish the, the land or the beach uh, landward of the breakwaters with beach quality sand. The project is situated along the Chesapeake Bay, adjacent to the YMC camp in the Silver Beach area of Northampton County. The project is protested by an adjacent property owner, our owners. Yeah, okay. Uh, Arrow is marking the spot on the eastern shore where the project is. It's north of Nassauax Creek and it's about seven and a half miles from the town of Nass uh, excuse the town of Exmoor, and just north of the uh, beachfront community of Silver Beach. Project is uh, also south of and adjacent to four uh, permitted breakwaters, which are right here. The Camp Silver Beach is located on approximately 151 acres of property and provides activities for eight to 16 year old campers. The camp has approximately 1,100 uh, linear feet of shorefront along the Chesapeake Bay, which is here in yellow, between here, oh, excuse me, sorry, uh, here in red, right there. There is an erosion rate since 2002 of approximately 3.6 feet and um, since the breakwaters to the north were installed in 2010 or 2011, the YMCA property has uh, averaged over five feet of erosion per year. However, the adjacent property, which is the Dinings Beach, which is also where the protestants are, uh, has not seen uh, very much erosion during that time since 2002. They've held their own. The applicant proposes to stabilize the shoreline by protecting, to protect the property by utilizing living shoreline techniques that include the construction of two new breakwaters and extension of a third existing structure, combined with minor bank grading and beach nourishment. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there is a direct impact of 4,175 feet of SAV that will be lost to the northern breakwater and the extension of the southern existing breakwater. Four adjacent property owners who own approximately 950 feet, which is just south of the YMCA property here, and down drift, uh, has protested the project. They have, uh, their property includes, I believe it's seven lots, which are uh, situated adjacent to the camp. Uh, their property is here and continues down this way to approximately here. The, far, the southern lot is not built on, and then there's probably about two more lots before you get into the northern end of the community of Silver Beach. <coughs> Dr. Kermit Ashby is a spokesperson for the protestants, and they have concerns that the breakwaters will cause erosion to their dunes and beach, which are not experiencing a great deal of erosion at this time. They also have concerns that a portion of the southern breakwater and beach nourishment will be uh, either on their property or in their riparian area. <coughs> Again, uh, the arrows are marking the north end of the existing breakwater and the southern end of their property, and here's their existing pier. Vims believes that the proposed structures are likely to function well to address erosion on the beach and protect the non-tidal freshwater pond. Uh, they also recommend mitigation for any direct impacts to the SAV. In addition, any <coughs> breakwater system is likely to impact shoreline immediately down drift to an unknown degree. The proposed project appears to have designed, uh, has been designed to minimize these impacts. 
if significant impacts to the dying drift shoreline are observed, additional sand nourishment could be added near the southern uh, structure. Uh, this is the outline of the 151 acre property. The road itself, Dining's Beach Road, comes in here. And then you can see the northern uh, breakwaters. Northampton County Wetlands Board approved their portion of the project back in December. Uh, the Department of Game and Inri Inri Inland Fisheries anticipates no significant adverse impacts. Uh, Department of Conservation and Recreation recommends an inventory of the Northeastern Beach Tiger Beetle be conducted uh, in the project area. However, it is staff's understanding that the applicant has agreed to the Army Corps of Engineers special conditions for the protection of the Tiger Beetle in their uh, pending regional permit 17. Uh, the Tiger Beetle, one of the reasons that it's in front of you today uh, and not next month or the month after is uh, they're trying to get uh, the construction done before the season starts, which is June through September. And again, no state agency expressed opposition to the project. This was the original design, uh, and, and you can see the property line of the protestants was here. The original design showed nourishment on either on their property or in front of their property in the riparian area, and actually even an extension of the uh, the uh, southern breakwater was in front of the potentially in front of their property in the riparian area. And this is the original design again. Now this is showing where the uh, SAV, submerged aquatic vegetation, will be lost. Here again, it's uh, 1,174 feet, square feet. Uh, because of the concerns of the uh, adjacent property owners, they redesigned the project so that the breakwater ends before the extension of the property line and the nourishment does too. Uh, I think we all believe that some of this nourishment will eventually move down in front of the, the protestants' property. Again, closer view. On the other end, showing the SAV, same impacts on the redesign. Cross sections, showing the fill behind the breakwaters. And this is the location of the pond and the pipe that goes underneath of the uh, nourishment and the breakwater. And, uh, has an outfall of minus one foot, and the inverse from the pond is a plus 1.42. Some ground shots looking south from the existing uh, southern permitted breakwater. That's the pier, YMCA pier. As you can see, there's erosion. Still looking south. This is a fairly low tide. I believe lower t uh, normal uh, mean low is probably a little higher up. Now we're looking north from the protestants' property. Looking north, <coughs> again you can see the bank here. And one last look at the pond itself, the freshwater pond. And I'll leave this up uh, and go through summary recommendation. Section 28.2104.1 of the Code of Virginia encourages the use of living shorelines as a preferred alternative for stabilizing tidal shorelines in the Commonwealth. The applicant's breakwater system is consistent with the legislation that was passed in 2011. Based on the concerns of the protestants, the applicant redesigned their living shoreline and breakwater system. The southern breakwater and nourishment now appears to be north of the, pro the protestants' property and now in front of the camp's property. While we are sensitive to the protestants' concerns, it appears that the project has been designed to minimize potential and adverse impacts or ad adverse effects along the adjoining southern beach while providing protection for the applicants' eroding shoreline. As suggested by our shoreline development best management practices, the breakwater project appears to have been designed to address the specific site conditions such as the wave climate and materials and has been designed with the appropriate spacing and distances offshore. However, as stated in our standard permit language, condition number two indicates that a permit grants no authority to the permittee to encroach upon the property rights, including riparian rights of others. 
since the southern breakwater and sand nourishment now appears to be in front of the applicant's property, staff can now support the project. Therefore, after evaluating the merits of the entire project and after considering all the factors contained in 28.2-1205A of the Code of Virginia and the concerns of the protestants, staff recommends approval of the applicant's redesigned breakwater system. In addition, we recommend comp com compensatory compensatory mitigation for 4,175 square feet direct impacts of SAV that, uh, and a, that a plan for SAV compensation shall be submitted to the Commission staff for review and acceptance. Uh, I added the uh, VIMS agreement to plant uh, 1, 000, or 4,175 uh, square feet of uh, SAV to your packet, so I think that portion of it has been, been accepted by staff. We further recommend that based on the redesign, a one-time royalty in the amount of $1,987.40 be assessed for the Savacuous Beach Nourishment Fill over 39,748 square feet be included at a rate of five cents per square foot. Staff also recommends a one-time royalty assessment of $111 for the outfall pipe encroachment over 37 feet of uh, state-owned submerged bottom at a rate of three dollars a square foot um, that's it I know the applicant their agent and the protestant are all here to answer any questions if I cannot questions of mr. Badger uh, mr. Ballard first and Ms. Lusk um, I'm not sure I've seen a, a mitigation for SAB agreement like this before Do, if we have one uh, we have, um, and it's sometimes it's not as large or involved as this one is, but yeah, we have. Mm -hmm. And I'll follow up. Follow up, Mr. Ballard. Um, what was the density of SAV in front of this area? What classification? In, in that area, I believe it was uh, 70 percent. Okay. I can, you can. Ms. Lusk? Um, my questions were about the SAV mitigation also do you um, is there a specific location for where this I believe it's going to be on the seaside Un unfortunately there's not a uh, uh, I don't believe there's any good places on the on the bay side right now that BIMS feels comfortable with planting and having success rate not along the eastern shore anyway further questions Mr. Tankard I have two questions. You mentioned in, in the earlier part of your presentation that you believe the uh, erosion had increased in front of Silver Beach because of the breakwaters to the north. Um, in front of the YMCA mm -hmm. property, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you look, you can see that. Sorry. It narrows after you get beyond the last tombola, or excuse me, the last breakwater, look how narrow that beach is. Right. And then it's starting to widen back out farther south you go. Uh, so, so yeah. my, Mr. Tucker, follow up, please. My question. So the, the, the tombola is effectively capturing that sand in front. And the drift is north to south, I guess. Is what yeah, the drift is north to south. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Vims is obviously would be better uh, to address this, but just you want to hear my opinion sure uh, the breakwaters have stopped the beach from <laughs> moving south the breakwaters have also stopped the erosion of the bank which would bring sand south too so between the two you're starving the beaches to the south okay mm -hmm. and so I have a follow-up question yes sir please um, when so when we begin to trap the sand with the new tombolas will we be covering eelgrass to the inside of those tombolas as well, and is that part of your calculation, 4,750? That's, that's part of the calculations, yeah. It, there is some sand, uh, part of that, but not a lot. If you looked at the VIMS charts, uh, their SAV maps, it's, it's more offshore where the, okay. where the uh, riprap is or breakwater. Mr. Zadrin? Uh, so you're telling us that when they, they installed the, the north uh, breakwaters, it eroded the beach to the south, right? That's correct. So what compensation, uh, if any, have y'all discussed for the uh, landowner to the south of the YMCA? If you already know it's going to erode his beach, I mean, oh, you going to give him any compensation or anything? 
that's why you all get paid the big bucks. Uh, we have, you know, it's no guarantee that it's going to erode it. It probably will. Films would be someone maybe to ask about that. Um, I got another question. Yes, sir, Mr. Zedrin. I mean, the whole idea behind these uh, uh, is, is to preserve the beach. So if we approve the project, we're just going to tear, tear the beach up to the south, right? It's a good chance. That, that will be an impact. Now, how, how big an impact, I don't know. <coughs> the design for these breakwaters are designed to have a less of an impact and some other breakwaters would be with the nourishment behind it and so forth. But yes, they will be an impact. Thank you. Further question? Ms. Lusk. I'm sorry. I ha no, um, no. I have another question about the SAV mitigation plan. Can, is there a reason why um, we didn't, you didn't consider like buying mitigation credits from an already established SAV um, or wetlands or well, some sort. Is there is the, there an is there a no. bank or something like the, that? It just seems no. like this is SAV in the bay side mm -hmm. that should be maybe mitigated in the bay aside from this. I don't disagree. Bills <clears throat> might be able to answer that better, um, but this is seems to be where they're going. It's more on the seaside at this point. We can, we'll go here from them. Okay, thank you. Can you tell me what makes us live in shoreline? Um, the breakwaters and the nourishment behind it. Okay. Further questions? Thank you, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Ballard. Question for Mr. Badger. Um, going up and down the shoreline, do you see a lot of these breakwaters? Is this pretty common? It's it's more common. There is um, besides the four. Sorry, sir. The four that are right above here, there are two more in front of the Tankard's property, not, not Ed's property, but uh, his, his cousins. Um, there are two other sets down in Northampton County, uh, separated, and Mr. Tankard's right in the middle of the two sets of breakwaters. Um, Cape Charles has theirs, uh, quite a few, and then Bay Creek has uh, a whole slew of seven down there. Mr. Tankard. And if you looked at all those seven breakwater situations, is it consistent that the property to the south uh, suffers sand, uh, de a decrease of sand in front of their properties? Down drift. Yes. Yes, in most cases, unless there's some type of armament adjacent to it. Um, if it's just pure beach, yeah, there's going to be. But that would also hold true if you did a uh, revetment or any type of structure along that front it's going to impact your, your neighbor. Along the Atlantic Ocean or the Chesapeake Bay, it's, it's going to be larger than up in a creek. Further questions? Thank you, Hank. Mm -hmm. I think in order to keep the flow going to answer the questions we've got, I'd like to hear from Vims at this point. Um, can you come forward? Uh, Mr. Commissioner, would you like to hear directly about the project that you're going to see in the hand handling, or would you like to have some questions about the SAD compensation? Well, let's do the SAV compensation first because that's a question Ms. Lusk has. You have been previously sworn. Certainly. State your name, please. Lyle Varnell, Virginia okay. Institute of Marine Science. Ms. Lusk, you had a question? Um, yes. I, I guess my question is um, what is the reasoning behind um, mitigating for the SAV that's being um, removed from the bay on the seaside? Well, that's a good question that we've been struggling with for quite a few years, actually. Um, we have, uh, through our SAV program since in the 1970s, been experimenting with uh, planting and seeding Zostra and Rupia in, in, Ches in Virginia's Chesapeake Bay and also in Maryland's a little bit up, up, up where the, the salinity hits it. We've had extremely little success. We have had some persistence in the mouth of the uh, James River, uh, but other places, it's, it's it, there, where, where there is not SAV is where you target for these, these situations because SAV comes and goes, as we all know, and we don't want to plant where there's also already SAV uh, for this. 
Um, in those areas where there has not historically been SAV, where we try to get it established, there's either too much wave energy, there's too much sedimentation. We've had very little success, and we've looked at this and tried. Um, we've worked with staff on what might be done. We do not like to be in this business for comp compensatory mitigation. There's no one else that can do it. We've been in some discussions with other parties about maybe doing this. There's, it, it's a very um, expensive and arduous process because you have to harvest the seeds, hold them for months, stir them daily, do, make sure that they're viable until you can plant them and they take. It's not an easy situation. Um, we are continuing to look in, in Chesapeake Bay and we're continuing to try to get out of the business of doing this, but no one else can do it right now. And we feel it's incumbent upon us, if no one else can, to, to, to do this for the, for, for the resources and for the, for the state. So um, the, uh, the applicant can maybe answer some more questions about specifics of the contract, but they, we get to work directly with our SAV program, Dr. Orr, uh, in this case, um, and, and to find out what might be done. But I will say in this one inst uh, in, in justification for what we do, we're not comfortable taking money from, from, a, from an applicant, whomever that might be, and just doing something and knowing that it's not going to be successful. We have a very high confidence that there's, since the success has been on the seaside, that we can not waste that investment from, from a, an applicant. So that's one of the reasons that, that this is really, the, at, at this moment, the only opportunity that we have that we can confidently say that we're going to get extra SAV um, resource with the investment that's required. So I'm not sure that that answered your question, but uh, that's. Do you have a follow up? I don't think so. Mr. Thank Zadrin, <laughs> does VIM support this project? Well, we don't go on record as supporting any project through our history. That's not what we, we do. But I will say this is in these types of, of uh, shoreline situations and wave climates, we do look for uh, uh, offshore breakwaters as the preferred option in our perspective. That's where we start to look at, you know, if we're, um, when we review a project, uh, this is probably what we would have, had we <coughs> been asked, what would you do in this situation, which we have been before. We would say, well, you need to consider an offshore stone breakwater with with beach nourishment in this in this uh, shoreline situation and wave climate. All right. Let me Your follow up. Yeah. So if if if, if uh, SAV is so hard to grow on the bay side, and this is a 70 percent concentration, what justifies uh, basically killing 4,000 square feet of SAV for this project? Well. Um, <laughs> Loaded question. Um, when we review these types of situations, we look at uh, we we have people and, and we can all look at some designs and say are they are they appropriate? Are are they well designed? Can there be any change in the design that would reduce where they have to be placed? Um, I think the applicant can answer this better for this specific situation because it is on a case-by-case, location-by-location situation. But when we looked at this, it was very properly designed and located to be functional. Any movement of it or anything that would you know, reduce a design or, or reduce the where it is located on some aqueous bottom, we, we consider that would probably reduce the function of it for the, for the area that it is, was targeted for. Further questions, Mr. Ballard? Um, on the shoreline, I can't tell from the picture approximately how much beach there is, but is it conceivable that eventually continued erosion would cause impacts to that SAV bed anyway, if you had the shoreline constantly eroding into that area? Well, that's been the history there, and the SAV has been persistent in this area at, at the high concentration that you saw. So if history is the judge, no, they, that, that was through the through evolutionary process, they've learned to, to, to adapt to that and deal with that. Okay. So. Mr. France. Yeah. Uh, my question would be, if erosion continues, it looks like that there may be a good chance that this pond would be, um, I guess, washed out. 
and what kind of effect would that have on all this SAV? Well, that would, um, I guess, in, in in the relative scheme of things, from a time perspective, it would it would be very temporary. There, the um, the shoreline would definitely change. It would probably cause erosion north and south, or or, or, uh, or lead to greater erosion north and south. And inside the pond would would maybe turn to a marsh. You never know, but. Uh, but either way, uh, when we get these, it's a, it's a, it's it's a either semi-mature or fully matured project that we're asked to review. So um, we understood when we got the project that uh, the pond, um, the, keeping the pond intact, was one of the concerns of the property owners. So that's how we responded. To that. Follow up. Yes, sir. So, so if nothing's done, there is an extremely good chance that this pot pond will be washed out. And that is a great possibility, yes. That's correct. For the questions, I have one. Um, in reading the SAV mitigation plan under item four, yes, it does not specifically identify a location. As you're well aware, on the seaside, there's a significant amount of aquaculture that goes on over there. Uh, I don't want to get into the business uh, of us providing a, a vehicle of course, SAV is good, and I do share the concern of this, the destruction of 40, almost 4,200 square feet of SAV. But on the other hand, from a mitigation perspective, I would trust that this, if this plan is approved, that the uh, location of established aquaculture will be taken into consideration prior to the implementation of the plan. Understood and definitely. We are very sensitive to those, those um issues all over the bay and the seaside and if it's necessary uh, yeah, we, we can change the wording of the contract if you'd like well, I think I think number four not, number four, a, number four just does not identify the location I would hate for someone I make sure I say this correctly and I don't mean it wrong um, unsupervised or just make an arbitrary decision to go and say I think I want to put it there and it becomes a conflict I don't want to be dealing with that well, uh, uh, I wish Dr. Orth was here to answer this, or maybe maybe the applicant can. However, my understanding is there, are, for for this size of a project, there are there are a, a couple of, a few locations that are candidates okay. for this that do not uh, have any effect on any aqua ongoing aquaculture okay. or least bottom cool. at this time. Cool. That makes me happy. <laughs> er. Um, any other questions of Mr. Varnell? Any further questions of VIMS pertaining to the project? Okay, thank y'all. Uh, at this time, the applicant, president, or representative? Yes, sir, could you come forward, please? Sir, would you raise your right hand? <coughs> Solomon, swear the testimony that you give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Could you state your name for the Thank record, you. please? My name is Bill Zazinski. I'm the Chief Property and Facility Officer for the YMCA of Southampton Roads. Good to have you here, Mr. Zazinski. Please proceed. Sure. Uh, as you know, the YMCA of Southampton Roads is a 501c3 nonprofit. Our breadth of who we serve uh, starts in northern, uh, in northern Eastern Shore and Onley, goes all the way down to Nags Head, North Carolina, and as far west as as South Boston. Uh, we have served uh, kids, over 40,000 kids the past 20 years at Camp Silver Beach. Camp Silver Beach is a residential or overnight camp. Uh, we have kids come from all over uh, the United States to attend our camps. Our staff is half uh, people from Virginia and half international, so it gives quite an experience for kids. Our programs that we have are, are things such as the traditional things of um, uh, climbing and, and zip lining and things like that. However, we do have a concentrated environmental program that we do. We also use the beachfront for canoeing, for um, sailing. We also have uh, things where we teach kids to get captain's licenses, things like that. So a lot of different things that we need the resource of the shoreline for. It's very important for us to do that. Um, in this project, we, we've been talking about this project for over a year now. Um, it is a project that is going to cost the YMCA Southampton Roads over a million dollars 
to put sand and stone on the beach. And it's something that, again, um, you know, as a person has to approve projects, a million dollars to that is kind of questionable. However, it's important for the impact that we have to our kids and our families that we serve. Um, as you know, we do have opposition to this. Um, we have tried to be responsible um, and environmentally friendly to this project. And uh, we've tried to look at a conservative way to do this. Uh, they have a friendly approach to the project. And, uh, and again, within the budget that we have. Um, as a good faith effort, we've had meetings with our, with our property owners to the south. We understand that there's an impact that's gonna happen here. Um, we gave the, the landowners an opportunity to tag along to this project um, with a proposed proposal so that they could maybe simultaneously do this project with us to save them some money for this. Um, again, it's been a, uh, a friendly discussion, trying to be as neighborly as possible here, but again, we do, as, you, as uh, Mr. Badger recommended or, or has, has talked about, um, we do have a window of opportunity to get this project done. Um, we, we supported our northern uh, landowners when they did that project. Um, we obviously understood that there's gonna be an impact to us as well, and as you can see, um, it has happened. Uh, over, you know, since the brake washers were installed over 10 years ago. Um, and, and finally, you know, we have been corporate part partners to Northampton County uh, for over 20 years. You know, um, every week when kids drop off or when parents drop off their kids, they spend money in Northampton County. Uh, they stay there, they, uh, they come back, and, uh, and, and again, the impact that we have for over 40,000 kids over the past 20 years is just uh, important to what we do uh, for a YMCA mission and continue this for the next 20 years. Thank you. Thank you. Questions of Mr. Zazinski by members of the commission. Uh, Mr. Ballard. Can you describe a little bit the width of your current shoreline and what your ultimate kind of concerns are with preventing more shore shoreline erosion? Sure. So I think Mr. Badger said we've been losing beach line or, or beachfront by about a rate of five, five feet per year. Um, every storm, every time a storm kicks up in the fall, we lose more. There were some pictures that Mr. Badger showed of our pier, and we have a walkover from uh, from our, some of our our family camp residences, and we've we've reduced that by about 30 feet over the years, and so. Again, if we, if we advertise Camp Silver Beach, if we keep on losing the beach, it's gonna be Camp Silver Land or something like that. So it's really important that we do something to replenish this beachfront. Further questions? Mr. Zadron? Uh, I've got a place in Nags Head, and um, the beach, it's eroded there tremendously. And what we've done down there is replenish the beach. Mm -hmm. And we just got through with about three mile section uh, in the Nags Head area, and they added about 150 feet to the beach. Was that considered as an option here, rather than put those breakwaters? I, I have to talk to my 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 I'll let my engineer talk and respond to that. But uh, again, we were just looking for the best long-term option at you know at at the best price we could as well. I think what we ought to do is get the, the agent going to speak. Can you come forward, sir? Just in case we'll have them both at the same time. Raise your right hand. You both, Mr. Zinsky, you stay up there if you would, please. Okay. Solomon, you want to testify you give be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. You state your name for the record, please. Neville Reynolds. Okay, Mr. Zedron. You heard Mr. Zedron's question. Could you please respond to that? Uh, yes, and I've got a couple of slides here that might put some context and answer some of the questions that, that have been asked. Okay, uh, we didn't, but I, I didn't know we were going to have two folks, but go ahead. Give, that's part of the presentation. Go ahead. It, it'll be quick. Yes, sir. I think, no, I think no, it'll. I'm not worried it. about the time. I'm just worried about the flow and making sure I get the things in proper order. But if you would please, before we go any further, answer Mr. Zedron's question, if you would please, pertaining to. And if you need to use a slide, so, do that. But please proceed with, with the response. So as opposed to straight beach nourishment, uh, some of the images that I'll show uh, will, will show that the, the feed of sand along the shoreline has been cut off far upstream of this particular property uh, to just put beach sand, you know, just to nourish this beach uh, would be a, a temporary solution. Uh, the sand would continue to feed on down the beach 
and we would be right back in the situation the property's in here uh, in, a, in a very short period of time. <coughs> so the, the breakwaters, um, and, and to Mr. Tankard's point, the breakwaters are, are really positioned uh, to allow the placed beach fill to stay, to stay where they are, to create uh, equilibrium embayments that dissipate wave energy and protect the, the, back, the dunes. Uh, without those, uh, it would be difficult to maintain the backshore elevation, and it would be difficult to maintain the beach in front of in front of Camp Silver Beach because there's no feed coming from the north. And I can show some images that illustrate that if that's helpful. Sure, proceed, please. <clears throat> um, just for context, again, this is uh, existing conditions and some of the things that we're be we've been dealing with that have been talked about. You see the freshwater pond here that is in a kind of precarious situation. I'll also point out the SAV line, and this is significant <coughs> because it's uh, very much affected the uh, configuration of this project, the placement of the breakwaters, and why the project uh, is, is, has been designed as it is. Uh, to some of the points about the shore width, beach width, uh, these are historic photos and show some of the activities uh, on the shoreline that have occurred historically. <coughs> and then some of the recent damage from uh, some of the recent hurricanes on the shoreline, uh, most specifically Florence and Michael. I draw your attention to these posts uh, that you can see in the dune and also uh, uh, observe the height of the the dune in this in this photo and sometime <laughs> later you can see the entire height of the dune in the backshore area has been diminished uh, and these are the posts that were once uh, on the face of the dune the walkover that Bill spoke about and the posts and you can see the, the pier in the background this is a high-level view. Uh, Camp Silver Beach Pier is in this location. Uh, this is the project area here, breakwater project that was mentioned uh, that was conducted about 10 years ago. But I want to draw your attention to the shoreline hardening that was really occurred uh, along this entire reach. Uh, this creek here provides a good reach break. So really the whole shoreline north of the Fisher property and then the YMCA property and uh, the Downing Beach properties to the south. The whole, the whole shoreline here has been hardened uh, with, a, with a bulkhead and with groins. And what this has done over time is it's, it's stopped the feed uh, moving to the south. Uh, you had some coarse sand in here. That's all been fed down. Uh, as that was depleted, that caused Mr. Fisher to uh, need to stabilize his shoreline. Um, and you'll notice, uh, to your point, Mr. Tankard, these tombolos were, were built as they will be built in this project. This sand was uh, mined from the bank or brought in. So these features are, are part of the project. Um, I'm not saying that there's not a lot of sand that, that does collect or that there's not some sand that collects in these embayments. There certainly is sand that collects, but it generally bypasses. And you can see that uh, or these, these embayments would be filled filled with sand. So there is some bypassing that has gone on. Certainly not enough because of the lack of feed coming into it to fill up these embayments or to continue to feed the uh, downdrift shoreline. This is just a close-up view uh, of the breakwater project and then uh, the shoreline adjustment that has occurred here and then the uh, narrow beach that is now protecting this freshwater pond. You do see the, the bump uh, of shoreline here in front of the Downing Beach properties. That's something that's been somewhat persistent in the historic aerials. Uh, so you do get into a more stable configuration as you move to the south. And a little more evidence of that is shown, again, for reference. Uh, you have the YMCA Pier at this location, uh, the Downing Beach properties here, and you see this bump in a shoreline 
and you'll notice the wide sand beaches that really are kind of locked in between these headland structures, uh, well, revetments that have become headlands to the south, and you see sand uh, residing in this location. Another feature I think is important, uh, this is a, a uh, drainage feature. There's one or two creeks that discharge uh, during major rain events uh, through the beach, and this has the effect of serving as a groin periodically, so this helps, you know, kind of back stack sand and also kind of limit the, the progression of, of shoreline change to the south. And this is an image just showing, uh, as Hank talked about and, and uh, others, the trend of shoreline retreat. Uh, the 38 shoreline is in red, 72 in green, and then the photo is at 2017. So this is actually uh, before some of those major storm events in 2018. But you can see down through here that uh, the Downing Beach area has been relatively stable. Uh, and as far as the downdrift effects, because of the situation of this shoreline, there is going to be an adjustment. Uh, because of the conditions here, we feel that adjustment is, is likely to be uh, fairly, fairly minimal. Uh, again, just to comment on some of the, the aspects of the project, um, to your point about other projects, breakwater projects along the shore, you, you probably will not find one that has a breakwater that is this long. Uh, normally, we would have put two other structures uh, in this system. Uh, in this case, we couldn't do that because of the, the SAV line. The SAV impacts would have would have been far they would far exceed uh, what we have in this project. Uh, the, we tried to pull this this structure back as far as possible, staying inside the SAV line, and that was just not not feasible at this at the, the northern end in order to get the right relationship to create stability in this embayment. Uh, had we gone out further with this structure, uh, we would have impacted more SAV, so we approached the adjacent property owner about extending his, his structure to get this relationship in a better configuration. Uh, this, this does have some SAV impact. Had we not done this, though, this would have had to come out a little bit further to be stable. Um, and then as, as Hank noticed, uh, noted we did uh, truncate the project at the property line uh, to prevent that encroachment. Um, the entire back shore area of the sand fill in here will be planted with Spartina patents and will be transitioned into the existing uh, eroding dune, dune system. So just in summary, we obviously have a documented uh, shoreline retreat that's threatening the programs at the YMCA and some of its infrastructure. We've attempted to apply a living shoreline approach here uh, and adapted it to minimize impacts, to try to restore and, and maintain some of the habitat that was there. Uh, we've talked about the SAV, uh, the backshore and dune habitat that will be created and protection of the freshwater pond. And just to emphasize some of the comments that uh, Mr. Varnell made about the SAV, uh, this is a real challenge in the regulatory programs in the state of Virginia uh, and in Maryland and other places. There really is no opportunity for mitigation. Uh, so we're very fortunate, we feel very fortunate to uh, have Dr. Orth and his programs, his ongoing research, uh, allow to take on this mitigation and to kind of piggyback on some of his research projects. We recognize the challenge of it being on the ocean side, but there really is no other option uh, to, to go with. Um, so we're, we feel fortunate to have, have that opportunity. Um, the impacts to adjacent properties, we can't deny that there will be a shoreline adjustment. Uh, we believe the position on the shoreline will, will minimize those impacts, and we think that natural drainage uh, feature that I pointed out helps influence and will help uh, the stability of the project on the down reef side. When you say shoreline adjustment, what do you mean by shoreline adjustment? Just as uh, you, we saw in this area here, there's going, there's very likely going to be an adjustment in this shoreline here, down drift of this, this point of diffraction. Questions of the gentleman? 
Mr. Tankard? Yes, uh, you mentioned this, these tumblers are a bit of a different shape, and that was because of the site. And would you maybe elaborate on that? Because I <clears> really <throat> haven't ever seen tumblers in this concave fashion before. Again, it's the, the concave nature of these are to get the, the ends of the structures away from the shoreline. Uh, that helps minimize the impact on the shoreline. The further offshore those are, uh, it, it limits the effect uh, in here and also uh, allows this embayment to sit in this location. Again, we had to get the structure back behind the SAB line, so we, we tried to get this point out as far as possible to allow this embayment to uh, be in a stable configuration. And the same in this point, we just we brought it back in as far as possible to stay behind the SAV line, but again, had to go out a little bit to create the relationship between these structures that allows this beach to, to be stable and protect the shoreline in the future. Further questions, Mr. Ballard? Would you consider that design change to be um, substantially better, or I assume worse, than if there were no SAV there? I guess the extent of my question is to what what lengths are you going to avoid that SAB, and would the design have substantially less impact in other ways if you weren't uh, trying to avoid those beds? Um, well, there's, there's two answers to that. If we were to go with a more traditional uh, breakwater configuration, the impacts would be greater. To come back less than this or to cut off the end of the, the structure on the, on the north side, uh, that would completely reduce the effectiveness of the plan, and then you'd be then you'd be talking about trying to put a revetment or a hardened structure in front of this uh, the freshwater pond. So I we've worked as hard as we can to avoid the, the impacts uh, again because the S mitigation is not an easy thing. We knew it was going to be a challenge. Um, We've, we've done what we can, I think, to minimize those impacts short of going to a revetment type structure. I, I guess my question is more that uh, what are the downsides to this design versus the traditional design that you would have done if SAV were not present? Today? Oh, okay, if F SAV were not present. Well, you'd get more of a, you'd have more pocket embayments. Uh, you'd have two structures in this location, in these locations here, so you, you'd have less linear footage of stone structure and more linear footage of sand. In this case, we, we don't have enough space here to rely on the sand to provide protection because that's really what these systems do. They allow the beaches to reside between the structures and for the backshore elevation to get to sufficient height to protect the embankments, and that would not, that's not achievable here. Uh, so absolutely it would be in terms of a living shoreline approach, in terms of minimizing uh, rock versus linear footage of sand, <laughs> that, would be, that would be a better configuration and that's what we would have, that's what we would have come up with. Other questions? Mr. Zazinski, how long has the YMCA owned this property? For the past 20 years, sir. 20 years. Okay. And Mr. Reynolds? If you were the next door neighbor, would you support this project? I would support it. Um, just as, as the YMCA supported the, the project to the north, without this project, the shoreline is going to continue to come apart. The feed to the south is, is deteriorating, as, as we've seen from looking to the north. Um, if this project doesn't go in and erosion continues, it's going to continue to uh, walk its way down the shoreline. Thank you. Further questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Anyone else here in support of this project? Anyone here in opposition to this project? Yes. Yes, sir. Could you come forward, please? Please raise your right hand. You saw them swear the testimony you give today be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Can you please state your name for the record? My name is Kermit Bernard Ashby. Okay. Mr. Ashby, proceed. I'm here representing uh, the aforementioned property owners of Downings Beach. Okay. Are you a property owner or are you an attorney? I am a property owner. I'm a medical doctor. Okay. I just, uh, the reason I ask if you're an attorney, you, I didn't need to swear you or whatever. just want to make sure yeah. the standing of who's doing what. Yeah. Proceed, and, please. And Thank if, you. if you would indulge me, 
Um, Mr. Badger, could you put up the slide that shows the uh, the shoreline of how much the beach had, the uh, Y has, and how much it is to the Downing's Beach property? Okay. I appreciate that. I don't have that technical expertise. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> I'm so glad you had more than me. <laughs> okay. um, I think this one's slide. This one? It uh, shows the footage. Right. Um, oh, right here. Yeah. Is that the one? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay. I mean, I think there's another one, too. There was one you had, like, a, a wedge, but that. Uh, the, the one before is better. This one? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'm, I'm uh, not an attorney. I'm here representing um, literally four generations of ownership of the property at Downings Beach. Um, I am a member of the third generation. Um, much of this property has been air property, most primarily owned by Downing, Ashby, and um, originally Reed, but then transferred to Heilig. Um, as you can see, uh, we are immediately south of the uh, YMCA camp. We have owned this property probably more than 65 years. Um, we remember prior owners, which was interesting, uh, because there was a nudist colony there. Um, well, and that's a we, change from the Y for sure. Folks from the from the Canadian uh, uh, country, but um, they were good neighbors. They just ran around me. Um, and then, approximately 20 years ago, as Mr. Zazinski and Mr. Uh, Reynolds have stated, uh, the Y purchased the property. My parents were very happy about that because. And we, as children, were very happy about that as well because we were not going to be restricted from going up and down the beach anymore. Um, that being said, um, we have a deep sensitivity and appreciation for what has happened to the Wise property. We do. I mean, it's obvious. It's stated in the, in the documents that prior to the breakwaters to the north that the fishers put in, they were experiencing erosion rate of about 3.6 feet per year. After that, that was accelerated to an erosion rate of five feet per year. We first learned of this project, we, the, the uh, owners, uh, and it was through me because I am the agent for um, a limited liability corporation that we formed about 15 years ago uh, that owns that property immediately adjacent to the Y. And, um, and then the other homeowners are private homeowners, us included. Uh, my family owns the uh, southernmost property that is wooded within those boundaries. Um, so on September 5th, I received in my mailbox a letter from the VMRC, uh, Mr. Badger, name was on it and it said that's when I learned about this project so immediately I contacted the other property owners let them know about it and said I'm going to contact Mr. Badger I did contact Mr. Badger shortly thereafter because we had two weeks to talk uh, to get any protest in um, I didn't call to protest on behalf of the owners I called to get informed <laughs> more about what the project was because we had no knowledge of this project until September 5th um, Mr. Badger was very kind. To, he spoke very candidly with, with me about what the project involved, um, what the potentials may be. I asked him, I said, we have two concerns. What does this mean to us? And is there an environmental impact study that's being conducted that may help us understand what it means to us? Um, he said there was not an environmental impact study per se. However, VIMS had been on the properties and uh, a report was forthcoming. Uh, I received a letter. Uh, he forwarded that letter from VIMS to me on October 25th. Uh, in the interim, I just kind of did some research and said, started learning about breakwaters and what that meant and all this kind of thing. Um, 
the report from VIMS very clearly stated in one of the last paragraphs that there would be an impact on the property, uh, which has been acknowledged here, on our property. Um, so therefore, we had a deep and serious concern of what this impact was going to be. They made the statement of unknown um, degree. Um, by the grace of God, Mother Nature has been very kind to our shoreline, as has been demonstrated uh, in the slides that have been shown. Um, so we reached out to the Y. <clears throat> first, I reached out through Mr. Badger. Mr. Badger asked me on our first conversation, had the Y talked with us about this project? I told him no. This was first knowledge that any of us had of this project. Um, so Mr. Badger said Neville Reynolds, Mr. Reynolds, uh, was the engineer on the project. He, he got in touch with him. And um, Mr. Reynolds and I had subsequently communicated via email. We were to have a phone conversation on a Friday. Uh, I think it was late October um, at 3 o'clock. That was all agreed upon. I never received that phone call after waiting an hour. So I sent Mr. Reynolds an email saying that since you didn't call me, maybe we'll talk next week. From that time forward, didn't hear anything from anybody involved with this project from the applicant side. Um, through the efforts of uh, Mr. Downing, Conway Downing Jr., Conway Downing Sr. was the, uh, one of the first or second generation owners. Um, he's deceased, as I told Samuel Ashby, my father, is deceased. Conway Downing is deceased. And Lawrence Heilig, the youngest in the group, is deceased. <coughs> so we are uh, heirs and of the property. Um, so we didn't hear <clears throat> anything from the Y until Mr. Downing uh, reached out to uh, Mr. Billy George, who was the, at that time the CEO and president of the YMCA of Southampton Roads, um, and they initiated conversations about having a meeting. Uh, that meeting occurred two days before Thanksgiving 2019 at Camp Silver Beach. It was a very cordial meeting. It was more or less a show and tell. That was, they showed us what they were going to do, and they told us what they were going to do. Um, at that time, as Mr. Zig, uh, Zizinski noted, uh, they did, they were prepared with uh, a conservative, as he stated, project that would help us, because our concern, by, by that time, we realized there was going to be a negative impact down drift. Again, by the grace of God, Mother Nature has been very kind to Downing's Beach. Um, and then we looked at the history, that the 3.6 feet of erosion that occurred at the Wise property prior to, and that was Mother Nature, and probably the further north um, projects that had been done, but certainly not as southward as the Fisher property. We had evidence that, I'm sure they were well aware of when they, they, they did not object to the project that the Fishers did in any form or fashion, that it was going to have a negative impact. And that negative impact is evidenced <laughs> by the fact that it accelerated from well, another foot and a half of erosion from 3.6 feet. So we, um, that concerned us. I think that would concern any of you. Um, this property is very meaningful to us. We don't charge anyone to use it use the property. The property immediately adjacent to the Y is referred to as a common area. We are the, the five of us, not four, but it's five beachfront owners, um, including Ashby Downing High LLC, which owns the property immediately adjacent uh, to the Y's property, to the, on the northern border of our property. Um, they um, said that okay, uh, we want to put these breakwaters in, and what y'all can do is this. This is, and Mr. Gunn, who is their contractor, uh, who would be doing the project, he showed us something. We have drawings and all this kind of stuff for what they did. Much, much, much smaller project to the tune that they said it would cost $130,000 to do. Mind you, it's November 26th. Um, we all, we, we broke bread together, we prayed together, we had lunch. 
and we went our ways, and we told them we would, be in we would respond to them. We wrote a letter. Mr. J James de Graffin, one of our property owners, Graffin Wright, Mr. James de Graffin Wright, one of our property owners who owns a home on the beach, um, <coughs> wrote a letter dated December 9th <coughs> that was sent to uh, Messrs. Anthony Walters, who was the incoming CEO and president and is now currently there, and Mr. Billy George, who was the outgoing. Um, we never received any response to that letter until 2.45 yesterday afternoon, um, which reviewing that letter, uh, we all agree it had some, um, let's say, inconsistencies there. Um, I followed up the December 9th letter on um, December, uh, on February 13th, saying you've not responded to us because Mr. Zazinski and the Y people had been asking, well, they knew that there was an encroachment. We have no objection to that encroachment. We have an objection to the fact that you're doing something and you're asking us to pass the hat on a short window notice to, to put in uh, something that is not going to get done when they do their project. Because we've got to go through the whole process of wetlands board, this board, and then a Corps of Engineers again, and that's not going to happen based on their timeline that they want to do to get their project completed by May. Um, I respect that they want to do this before the opening of the season. Um, but I've not seen anything that says it would cause any detriment to them if they waited until the close of the season. Now, I may not be privy to certain other considerations, but that's six or seven months at the most away. Um, so, our concern has been that the Y has not been forthcoming. They have not dealt with us in good faith. When you send me a letter of response to a letter two and a half months prior that was sent to you, less than 24 hours before this hearing occurs, um, that to me does not sound like you are uh, really being responsive. And uh, we all have felt that way. I asked all the members, I said, have you heard from them? Have you heard from them? Mr. Zazinski again, uh, he asked me, what, did we have a decision? We sent him a letter and said, read the first letter, and here's an expounding on that letter to tell you, here's what we want to know before we make some decision about it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what they did was they had to cut it back because I think you wanted to know, why are you encroaching on the neighbor's property? Um, actually, what they had originally, yes, might help us a little bit, but they're asking us, and I think it was Mr. Tankard may have asked the question. I don't know if Mr. Tankard or Mr. Zadron asked the question about compensation. They said the project was $130,000. I subsequently met with Mr. C. Scott Hardaway over at VIMS. My wife and I went over there and met with him, had a very good meeting with him. Uh, he explained to us not only these pictures that show you 38 and 96 and 2017, he went through every decade since they had been recording this. And he showed us, again, by the grace of God, Mother Nature has been kind to our beaches. And he showed that subsequent to those breakwaters to the north of the wire property, they suffered it accelerated erosion. So our concerns that are not expounded on in the documents you have are an acceleration of what heretofore has been fairly generous Mother Nature treatment of Downing's Beach. So now you're going to put in these, these breakwaters and accelerate them unless we do something. So we have to pass the head after learning about this uh, in November 26, right in the holiday season, to see if we can come up with 130,000 because they say they have no more money, they don't have any money, their budget's tight. And I accept budgets, but all we're asking, have been asking, is for you to sit down and work with us, respond in kind, in a timely way, to our concerns and what our proposals might be. Uh, I respect budgets. 
Um, but they've been working on this accordingly. Uh, roughly, to my knowledge, Mr. George, Billy George said that they started on this February of last year. Um, we learned about it in September. And then we got really down to brass tacks where we sat down with them and we were told and shown what they were going to do in November, late November. And so here we are. Um, we have no, we have a, no protest or objection to the project itself. We have a protest and objection to the project going forward, forward without consultation and real, true meetings with us to come to some sort of terms and a little more time so that maybe if we have to pass the hat, we can come up with the money. Grants are available, all that kind of stuff. None of us have that expertise. And you know, it, was, it came to our attention about a breakwater on the um, eastern shore of, not the eastern, but the eastward facing shore of the uh, bay that um, was done where they, the people had uh, received some grants from this tiger beetle society or something and what have you. That's fine, but we're not gonna get that done in two or three months and we have no guarantees that we'll get any money. So um, everybody seems to be getting compensation, the state does. I respect that the state wants to protect the shoreline. The state's getting their compensation, albeit not a lot of money. I've heard $1,000 and $300 and $111 and that kind of thing. Uh, yes, this is $130,000, but then after meeting with Mr. Hardaway, other expenses came into play that he appraised us of. There's expenses to file permits. We don't have that expertise, so we're gonna have to hire someone, just like someone in the earlier project said. She was hired to do that. So we'll have to absorb that cost. Then what we'll have to do is, Mr. Hardaway assured us that there is going to be ongoing maintenance of these projects with sand, and this is special sand because of the tiger beetle population. So that expense it comes on top of it. So these are things that we need time to to consider. We'd like to work with the Y. They're good neighbors. But we subscribe to the theory, love thy neighbor as thyself. And so we just ask that, you know, maybe you are, you're not going to get it done before the season starts in May. I don't know that that's critical. I don't know that. But if they can, if we have more time, and if they work with us in good faith so that we can all come to a reasonable compromise, then maybe we, we probably will come around and say we support the project as originally drawn. So um, this is where we are. And this is why um, I'm here before you, because we're not objecting to the project. We had to lodge it as a protest, but it's a conditional protest that can be worked out. And I will quote one of the gentlemen on the wetlands board over in Northampton County when I went to the first and the second meeting because the first meeting was postponed. My wife and I drove over there 90 miles to get there. And we get there and we find out that the meeting's been postponed because the Y had called and said they wanted to postpone it. Fine, I got to meet the wetlands board people. But at the second wetlands board meeting, the uh, chairman of the board said, can't you folks, it sounds to me like you folks need to get together and work something out. That was on December 13th when he made that statement. And the silence was deafening from the Y side of the room. Um, Mr. Zazinski talked about how their budget was tight and what have you. Finally, Mr. J we said we want to get a review of, by an independent engineer of what you've offered us to do to help out, because you can tell us anything. But what you've offered us to do that might mitigate that accelerated erosion on our property. Um, and we said that, in turn, has a cost to it. Mr. George stood up and said, how much do you think that will cost? And I said, I don't know. I'm not an engineer, but I would, I would think no more than $10,000. He said, we will give you $10,000 for that. So <clears throat> uh, with that being said, I asked, as anyone would say in a business situation, can I get that in writing? I've yet to have that in writing. Of course, we've yet to incur that bill, so it's not a uh, threat to us as it is right now. That may come to pass in the future if you see fit to delay this project 
um, which is what we're asking, until we can sit down with the folks from Greater Hampton Road, Southampton Roads Y, and talk about this. With that being said, I'll entertain any questions you may have. Thank you, Doctor. Any questions? Mr. Zedron, please. Uh, how long are you talking about for the delay? Um, I would say, Mr. Zedron, at least six months. You, if somebody came to you and asked you to lay out $130,000 on November 26 to do something that by no fault of your own, but because of something that they're doing, how would that sound to you? Mr. Tankard. Uh, Dr. Ashby, you mentioned the term uh, heirs property. Yes, sir. And I suspect that's a difficulty in perhaps arriving at some decisions with this piece of property. No, not really. No. No, not really. Would you maybe also describe heirs property to Heirs property. When the property was originally purchased by my father and Dr. Conway Downing Sr. and Dr. Leon Reed Sr., um, who was from <coughs> Richmond, this was way back probably in the 60s that they purchased the property because the Downing family owned the property, hence Downing's Road, Downing's Beach. Um, they owned the property, but they could not afford to uh, pay the taxes on the property. So the offer was made to keep the property in the family. Can you gentlemen buy the properties? Which they did. As kids, my dad came home and said, we just bought a beach. And I said, okay, we were delighted. That's all it meant to us. So now the property has been passed down. When my father was living, Dr. Downing Sr. was living, uh, Dr. Reed decided he was gonna live on the Gloucester side in Capahosi, and he sold his to the Hylix. Um, we said we need to create a more business-like relationship because um, we have non-contiguous, or as I like to refer to, to them as non-waterfront property owners. And in the past, it had been a handshake and sort of thing. You can use the beach, come on down, everybody can enjoy the beach. But as time goes on, we don't know that that would continue. So we said, let's put this in a more business-like relationship. We formed a um, LLC, Ashby Downing Heilig, um, and which has been passed on. And we, um, what we did was we carved out the area ne immediately next to the Wise property, and we could, named it, it's a half acre, named it the common area, in quotes. That means that anybody that lives off the beach, they have beach because they have a legal, um, right of enjoyment and sharing in the tax to the extent of how many lots they may own. So if you own one lot, you'll, you pay right now one-tenth of the, the tax, uh, the county tax on that property. That's the most expensive property tax-wise that we have over there. We have other properties because uh, it's a much larger property than just the beach. But um, that's what I mean by it. Thank you. Further questions? Mr. Yeah, Miner. Yes, uh, just a few questions. How many folks live in this area? Excuse me, Mr. Miner. How many folks live in this area? In this area? How many folks live in How this many area? How many folks live here? How many folks live yes. in the Downings Beach area? Well, just within three miles, let, let's say within three miles of Downings Beach, yes. Um, I don't know that number. I don't know the population of that area. So what you're telling us is that you kind of feel that there wasn't really true community engagement. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, again, with the immediate, the, the, when I heard from Mr. Badger, mm -hmm. it said adjacent property owners. Mm -hmm. We were an adjacent property owner to the south. Mm -hmm. The Fishers were an adjacent property owner to the north. Mr. Badger told me that the Fishers had an objection initially about the pipe and all that business. Um, but then with the adjacent property owners to the south. As far as other people in that area, I don't know, you know, when you leave Bam Downings Beach and you go on, correct me if I'm wrong, Oak Oconic Road um, and go back, there's several homeowners and properties out there, farms. Uh, I don't know how many people are there. What I can tell you is that there's a total of 16 property owners and um, us example, we own the property to the uh, southernmost property where the wooded area is, where that arrow points. Uh, down just above it. Uh, I own that property 
with my two brothers, okay? And then the Downing property, which is right in the middle, they own that, the Conway Downing Jr. owns that property with his two sisters with whom <coughs> I've been acquainted for a lifetime. Um, the common area that I just spoke of is owned by Ashby Downing and Holly, but as well as seven other property owners that don't live on the beachfront. So it's a total of 16 people that share in this. However, however, we have never restricted use of our beach by community people. We have never asked for anything from them other than just clean up behind yourself. So let's just say with the 16 people, if we delayed this project, if we delayed this, mm -hmm. um, do you, I, personally, I think, because I, I do community engagement, yes, and I promote myself, but I think six months is entirely too long. So is it something that you all can they're compromise, compromise you all can come up with compromise in reference to saying we can have two or three meetings within the next month and a half or a month or you know six months is just entirely too long. Okay, Especially Mr. Minor, I, I beg to disagree and I respectfully disagree. Uh -huh. The reason I say this is we have owners that live in Baltimore, Maryland, one that lives in New Jersey who just lost her mother, an icon in this country, Miss by Katherine Johnson. Johnson, I saw that, yes. Figures. Yeah, Rest. that's one of the owners. The, she lives in New Jersey, and now she's done trying to deal with her mother's funeral. Mm -hmm. um, we have Mr. Conway Downing Jr., who lives in Washington, D.C. We have Mr. Bill, William and Kim Allen, and Mrs. Kim Allen, who live in Florida and Delaware, because their business is in Delaware, but they also have a home in Florida. So we have those people, those are the principal beachfront people. So bringing these people together on a meeting, short of a conference call, um, gets a bit dicey. The other reason I said six months is because that's after the beach, the Camp Silver Beach season is over. They don't want to be out there doing this project during the season, I don't think. So. Their, their push is to get this project done before the season opens in May. Yeah, let me, ma'am, I'll be able to help. Mm -hmm. um, where, Hank, yes. Mr. Patrick, what is that time of year restriction on the tiger beetle? When does it start? Um, it's, see, I think it's, that might have something uh, to do with it. Is, yeah, it's, it's mid-May now through September. So if they were to do just a couple of months, it may be into the tiger beetle restriction That's area. Okay. So okay. that okay. might regardless of how I understand absolutely your point but then again if we go the two months maybe two and a half months three months then we're into the tiger beetle problem as well so they wouldn't be able to do any work okay. then I yeah okay further questions of uh, Dr. Ashby Mr. Yes, Ballard sir. um I, I certainly understand your concerns this is uh, a, a tough situation because if I were in your position I would I would be terrified at the thought of accelerating erosion Good work. Um, but I, I guess my question is, um, we, we've got a great camp here that mm -hmm. manages folks to utilize this beautiful water. And while you've got 16 residents that get to do that, they're introducing to thousands of kids uh, this same stretch of beach uh, and teaching them just very useful skills. Uh, it's an incredible camp. Um, and. What, what would you have them do? Because they're watching their shoreline disappear. Um, well, how would you recommend they, they um, mitigate that? Again, I only ask for six or seven months until the end of the camp season, okay? That gives us a little more time, a little more time to start at least to, if they do, want to meet in good faith with us and have good faith conversations about how we can come to an amicable resolution so that they can get that project in before the end of 2020, then good. So I'm only asking for that minute. I don't think, particularly since the erosion rate is five feet per year, that that window is going to close so fast and tight on them that they're gonna lose that five feet in that window. So what would, what, we recognize what you said. We fully recognize what, we, what you said. We were happy, as I said, my parents were very happy when they came there. They do great things. I'm not a member of, the, uh, of Southampton Rose, but they are good, they've been good neighbors. And until now, like I, I said at the meeting in November, good neighbors, 
how is it stated? Good fences make good neighbors, okay? And so you got to deal with me in a good way. It's, it, this, this has all been, it seems, and when you don't respond to my communications for two and a half months, that tells me you disregard me. And then you make statements that are disingenuous and just flat, in some cases, not true, albeit Mr. Anthony Walters is the new CEO and president. So he said he wasn't around when this was going on and that was going on. He didn't know. However, so I'll give him a, a pass on that. But that doesn't seem to me that you're being uh, genuine with us. You have a concern. Uh, you share our concerns. And you don't seem to recognize we do recognize your problem, and we don't want to see Camp Silver Beach to become Camp Silver. So seven, six, seven months, I don't think is, is, is a big stretch because uh, I, I just don't see it as being that, detrimental, that much more detrimental to their property than it has been so far. Dr. Ashby, yes, you're, you're under oath and you've come before us um, in what a, to me appears to be a very, very genuine manner. Um, what you're saying to us is that if the time, <clears throat> excuse me, was there to have dialogue, yes. to discuss, yes. that at this juncture, you're not opposed to the project per se. Not what you're opposed to is the lack of information flow lack of dialogue and lack of understanding that has occurred during the course of this process. Am I correct? Yes, and to add to that, a lack of give and take, a lack of working together. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a Mr. Tankard. So, so you mentioned not that this YMC was quote unquote not forthcoming and not responsive. Yes, sir. Uh, and you still, you believe that to, as you stand here before still? I do so, sir, because again, less than 24 hours before this meeting and less than 24 hours from this point in time, we had not received any written communication in response, and we still have really not received any written communication in response to what Mr. DeGraffenreich proposed on December 9th, nor what I followed up with on February the 13th, and again sending Mr. DeGraffenreich's letter. Thank you. Any further questions of the gentleman? <coughs> Thank you, doctor. Thank you, sir. Anyone else here in opposition to the project? Okay, the applicant has five minutes to rebut, wrap it up, and then we'll put it before the commission. Thank you. Um, so, um, we did have some conversations with um, Mr. Conway Downing, our CEO, Billy George did prior to that. There's also some other conversations because of Mr. Downing wanted to propose a um, kind of a, a neighborly thing of helping them with some with some beach access as well. So that was a, that's another topic here. Um, they did send us a letter and they did request that um, that that the YMCA pay for uh, their project as well as ours. And again, our, our responses and you can you can know from the wetlands meetings. And I don't don't think we needed another written response because we, we did address this in December with, um, with um, um, owners there at the, at the same wetlands meeting. And, and our stance was basically that, um, you know, we have our project. We can't continue to support projects south of us because if we support and pay for the Downing uh, landowner's project, what happens to the owners to the south of them? Are they going to come to the YMCA and say, now this is our, your responsibility to protect our beachfront. So there has to be a time and a place that we can draw that line in the sand. Um, again, we need to be good stewards of, of our YMCA money and, and the donors that we have. Um, we, we tried to be forthcoming with what we, we, we did. We, we brought our engineers in uh, to have that meeting again. We've kind of delayed this project. We want to start this project in December, trying to get everything going, but we've tried to be forthcoming with everything and, and keep on waiting and waiting for responses and things. Yes, uh, our new CEO, Mr. Walters, did send a response yesterday, uh, basically in the same stance that we have said, is, is that we cannot continue to support somebody else's project here. But we gave them an opportunity 
uh, to do the project alongside of us at a reduced rate and if they would have to deploy and, and pay for someone to set up and do that at a different time of the day. Um, this project, again, we do have Tiger Beetle limitations on when we can, we can uh, start this project and complete this project. And so um, we want to try and get this project uh, completed before camp starts uh, because if another storm kicks up in September, we're going to lose five more feet. It's going to cost us more. Um, and again, we did this project trying to show them uh, extending that one, uh, that one breakwater that was going to cost at the YMCA's cost to protect some of their, uh, their southernmost land, plus add, adding more, uh, more um, sand to that project as well. So okay. trying to do some things here to make it good of it. I guess one question I've got just to mm -hmm. set the table as far as the communication aspect of it. Was there scheduled to be a 3 o'clock phone call that the gentleman waited for and somebody didn't make? I, I That was between Mr. Reynolds and, and Dr. Mr. Reynolds? Ashby. We you can come to the podium, please, to address the commission. My recollection is we did, uh, there was an email exchange about a, th a 3 o'clock call. Uh, folks from the Y, other folks from uh, Dr. Ashby's group were involved in it. It, it never seemed to come to, to fruition. Uh, By whose fault? I don't know that, but I, I know it didn't happen, and frankly, we were concerned about it as well at the time. Follow-up to the question. Any further questions of the applicant? Mr. Tankard. So, so just so I'm clear that um, besides the, the, the phone call and other letters that were sent out, uh, do you dispute any of that, uh, letters being sent to you? And yes, we, no, we, we received two letters from them. Um, again, we received the first letter on December 12th. Um, we did not respond until the Wetlands Board meeting, which, uh, again, uh, Dr. Ashby and his wife were present. Uh, I, I, you know, I was specific and clear on where our YMCA stance was. Uh, finally, as, as the meeting went on, uh, our, my, um, my retired, now retired CEO, Billy George, uh, did stamp, step <coughs> up and say that he would give $10,000 towards uh, outside consultation of what we proposed to them. Uh, and then uh, they did send another follow-up letter. They have two of their landowners are attorneys, and so uh, um, we just waited, and, and then we waited for a response, and, and our CEO, uh, Anthony Walters, who is just fairly new on the job, did respond um, yesterday. So you want to follow up? Okay, Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, Tanker, then Mr. Zadron. So, and, but you, you are clear that this project will have impact on their property? Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Zadron. If uh, we continue this matter, who is going to be the point person for the YMCA that can actually facilitate this communication and try to work on a compromise? Sure, M myself will, uh, two, you know, several of our senior leaders will, will be part of that conversation, sir. Can that information be given to uh, Dr. Ashby? Yeah, Dr. Ashby has that, those contacts. Okay. I guess in the, in the flow of things, I can. That's it's quasi judicial, and we're. Um, Realizing that the YMCA, great organization, as Mr. Ballard <clears throat> has alluded to, I've got a great YMCA in the Luther Family YMCA over in Smithfield, um, supportive of them. Um, I know the fundamental tenet of the YMCA is to be good neighbors, yes, sir. to do the very best they can. They rely on public support. They rely on uh, their what YMCA stands for. Correct. Um, is there a problem considering what Mr. Ash or Dr. Ashby had to say in continuing this matter so that maybe better discussions and relations can be worked out during the course of this, this matter? You know, we want to do what's right and what's best for everyone I believe involved. that. Um, and, and so it is important to us. I, I guess the, the it, it, and again, we said this to, to Dr. Ashby and in our, in our response on yesterday is that we cannot, um, we cannot support that project for, for their beach replenishment. Um, you know, so, it, and, and again, we, we've had conversations. We, we've uh, been full disclosure of what we propose to do with it. Um, 
you know, we would like to um, move forward with this project as soon as we can. So you believe that there is an adequate, regardless of what he has said, you mm -hmm. believe there's been adequate dialogue, that all the chips are on the table and everybody's clear about what's going on? I, I, yes, it is. I, I feel, again, it, it is going to have an impact on their beachfront just like our northern neighbors had the same impact on us. Unfortunately, we wish that everyone to the north to the state line would have never done their uh, their beach mitigation so that we would we wouldn't be in this problem and just so that I'm straight there was an offer that of, of ten thousand dollars for mitigation yes to that project yes it was and it was a handshake at the end of the wetlands that we'll be happy to do but that. now on the record it's on the record it yes okay yes and it was on the wetlands record as well so okay <laughs> further questions Thank you, sir. Thank you. Matters before the commission for discussion and action. Mr. Zedron. You know, I kind of look at this just like the situation we had with the Ocean View project. You know, it, it was all up to, down the beach, and and, it, and and you know, it was like, well, if you let this one take the sand, it's going to affect that one, and back and forth and back and forth. And I think what we did was kick that back to the Norfolk uh, Wetlands Board and said, why don't you get a, uh, you know, look at this whole beach at one time and come up with a project and, and get it done. Uh, that's what I see here. Uh, this is a very um, tough case because what we're doing to help this person, we're doing to hurt the next one. And, and so I think that makes us a little different in dynamics. And, and what I'm hearing is this whole beach line needs to be considered as one project. And I don't know who that would go to. I don't know if that would go to the core or, or who, but I would, uh, support a uh, continuance past whatever the the Be Beatles uh, time is uh, to continue past that and, and then uh, direct our staff to assist these two and and contact the rest of the beach owners down there see if we can't do this whole beach a, as a uh, living beach line can I can I ask staff or Vims to see if that is a possibility before we proceed with that would that be okay with you yes Badger, you jumped up, you get to respond. I, I'm very familiar with Silver Beach. Okay. You've got about from the Dinings Beach and the Y down to Silver Beach proper, probably a quarter of a mile. Out of that, you probably have another seven, eight on top of the Dinings Beach group. Seven uh, or eight what? Uh, property owners. Okay, sir. Before you get to the bulkheaded areas that are hidden, hidden by sand uh, down there. So they're not having a problem either. I don't know why they would get involved with this. Please follow up. But, but, but what you're telling me here, though, is as soon as they put the uh, breakwaters here on the YMCA, it's going to affect the property next to them. And then if they do it, it's going to affect the other ones. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. The domino effect. Right. We, we need to look at the whole beach here. Welcome to do it. You're not going to get them on board. I, I just tell you that right now. From our little group that we've talked about at Silver Beach, uh, it's set, well, it's probably 10 of them, and they're going, that's just too much money for, for what they've got invested in the property. So I don't think you're going to get the group down all the sides of the whole reach. Okay. Mr. Ballard, thank you. Um, I can share some perspective on this because I've unfortunately <laughs> had to build four of these things and possibly a fifth coming at some point. Um, but this whole shoreline um, is, is plagued by this problem uh, of erosion. Uh, a lot of these bars have um, been thinning, disappearing, uh, and causing further erosion along the shoreline at faster rates than have been seen. At least on my property, that was the case. Uh, and for the record, I'm a little bit south of here, probably 10 miles or so. Um, and the, unfortunately, these structures are just incredibly expensive. Um, I can say from my experience that $130,000 doesn't touch what some of these cost. Um, and so, you know, I, I agree with Mr. Badger that trying to get a large-scale beach solution like this done is um, a, a very low likelihood of happening because the amount of money it would require 
um, from landowners or it has to be funded somewhere. Um, th this situation is very tough. I can say in my case, we, we didn't have an adjacent beach owner. Uh, we're separated by creeks on both our northern and southern side. Um, so it was easier, but this is very tough. And I think at the end of the day, I kind of come down to the applicant's right to protect their property. And yes, it has an impact to the southern property, but um, at what point do you say the applicant can't do anything to save their upland? And I, I don't view this as a disappearing of a beach. I view it as continued shoreline erosion that's going to keep occurring. Um, and it's going to cut into those trees. You're going to have dead trees. That pond is going to become marsh. Uh, <coughs> it, it's a problem that won't stop. Um, so I, I sort of feel that even if we give another seven months, we're going to come to this exact same conclusion uh, that it's going to affect the uh, southern beaches. And they're going to be against it. If I were them, I would be against it. Um, and we're going to be back here in a little bit, so I'd be inclined to vote on the project, and I would reluctantly be in favor of the project as proposed. Thank you, Mr. Ballard, for the comment. Uh, I've got, uh, well, it's Dr. Neal first, Dr. Zeed, and Mr. Tanker. Right. I, I agree with what Commissioner Ballard just said mostly. I would be more in favor of continuance to allow these two groups to talk some more. Uh, if you make me vote today, I'm, I'm going to vote to approve it. I'd rather vote later. Um, I agree with him that the YMCA, we, we uh, need to allow them to protect their, their eroding shoreline. Um, I think it would behoove them and their neighbors to, to come to a more amicable agreement to talk a little bit more about how they're going to do that, and it may make the relationships better in the future. Uh, I, and I, I don't need to put a six months or seven months. I, you know, just give them, just continue it a little bit before we make that final decision. Let them talk a little bit more. Um, but if you make me vote today, I, I was, I'm not going to oppose it. Mr. Zedron, uh, what encouraged me is uh, Dr. Ashby did not say that he wanted the YMCA to pay for everything. What he said was, give us a little bit of time to, uh, and we know the permitting process is not 30 days. It takes months to go through this. And so what he's saying, at least what I heard, put it that way, what I heard was, look, let, let, let us find out what our options are. Let us find out what the permitting process is. We're going to have to hire somebody to do that. I'm no expert at that, he said, and, and give us that opportunity. He didn't say, matter of fact, he did say, he said, we're not even opposed to the original plans here, but, but let us see what we can do to protect theirs, and maybe they're going to be paying for theirs. And he, he didn't say that we're going to expect a YMCA. He said, he said that, that, that they would probably come up with the money. Uh, so I, I think we owe him an opportunity to, to research this, and, and it's not like he just, you know, didn't, he called them once and that was it. He's been corresponding with, with YMCA right on. And so I don't see where this is going to hurt them, even if they have to pay for their own project. And, and, and the other side of that coin is, if, if the contractor's out there, he's sure going to charge them a lot less to go right, right on down the beach through their property than if they finish the project for the YMCA, and then they got to bring all the equipment back and, and do the uh, Downing's Beach. So I, I don't see what my motion would be uh, is that we continue to pass whatever these beetles, uh, uh, and I, I don't remember exactly when that window ends, but when that it window ends, can you tell me? Or something. There seems to be some variation, but it's about middle of May through the end of September. Okay. All right. So I would move. Can we can, can we still have a discussion? Because right. I've got Mr. Right. Tanker has got his hand up, and I'd, I'd like to. All right. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, you know. What I, it's disturbing to me the lack of communication. I, I'm a YMCA believer. I think it's a great thing. It's been a great thing for not only our community, but people for, beyond our community, youngsters <coughs> in particular. Uh, but this lack of communication is disturbing. And 
their neighbors, they know, they've testified, that they know that it's gonna be harmful to their southern neighbor. So why not communicate with the southern neighbor you're going to harm? Uh, I, I vote, for, I would vote for continuance. If you made me vote, I would vote no. Anyone else? Ms. Lusk, then Mr. Ballard. Um, I would like to echo uh, some of the thoughts that the other commissioners made. I um, also would very much like to support this project. I think the, um, the why is important on the Eastern Shore and Camp Silver Beach is um, certainly a gem for the Eastern Shore. Uh, in fact, I dropped my daughter off for camp last year for a first time camper. Um, so definitely want to see this go through. I agree with Mr. Zedrin. I didn't hear um, Dr. Ashby say that he expected the Y to pay for the project either. But I agree that um, <clears throat> giving him some time to, to figure out what they can do and to see if they can do their project side by side with the Y seems um, reasonable. I'm also still hung up on the SAV mitigation agreement. Um, to me, setting a precedent for um, mitigating eelgrass from the Chesapeake Bay where the water quality concerns are very different than the water quality concerns on the seaside doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I also uh, <clears throat> echo the thoughts. There's already a delicate balance between aquaculture and eelgrass on the seaside, and I think um, this, this precedent makes me very uncomfortable. So if we are going to continue, which I would support, I would suggest that we also um, have a directive to look at alternatives to this agreement. Mr. Ballard, do you have a um, I think, uh, I, I certainly feel the communication side of things, um, and they, they, it could have gone a lot better. Um, I guess I'd also point out that they have known about this since September. Um, communication can be a two-way street. Uh, I'm not sure uh, writing a letter to the CEO of a large organization and then saying you didn't get a response is necessarily uh, realistic. Um, I can't write the CEO of Coca-Cola and then say he never responded to me. Um, but the CEO was involved in some of the dialogue. Um, but I have seen these projects held up on lack of communication and folks saying they weren't communicated with, but I always ask, did you write a follow-up letter? Did you call? Did you call his assistant? And sometimes that's what we have to do to get through to larger organizations. Um, and is it correct or absolutely right or the way we'd want things done? No. but. Um, I, I just didn't see a whole disregard of communication. There were handshake deals. They talked to them about giving $10,000. They were present at these wetlands board meetings. Um, there were responses and dialogue. They had the on-site meeting before Thanksgiving, and the whole project's been going on <coughs> for now, uh, September through now. It's roughly five months that they've had to dialogue this out, and I've just seen probably more than what would normally occur communication on a lot of these things. Um, so that's why I'd be in favor of moving it forward, uh, as staff has recommended, I believe. Thank you, sir. <coughs> well, while I agree with you, I tend to disagree just somewhat and respectfully do, I, I think that that's why I asked the question about the initial phone call and then the fact that the letter was received at 2.45 yesterday. Um, I, think, I think things could have gone better as far as the communications was concerned when you're dealing with uh, this type of a project. Also go to the law, which is 28.2.1205 of the Code of Virginia, which says we should take into consideration, and I'll read the five or the six sections just to be proper other reasonable and permissible uses of state waters and state owned bottomlands, marine and fishery resources of the Commonwealth, tidal wetlands, except when this has or will be determined under provisions chapter 13 this title, adjacent nearby properties, water quality, and submerged aquatic vegetation. 
tend to deal or to agree with my colleague, Ms. Lusk. I have a, we, we work diligently to protect SEV, and I, I, I go both ways as far as that's concerned. I've been clear on the record as far as how I believe SAV and aquaculture need to work together hand in hand to make sure that they're collect collective partners for the benefit of the environment, um, but to, to intentionally disturb <coughs> almost 4,200 square feet of SAV, remove it from the bay over to the seaside does cause me some concern. <coughs> in addition, the fact that this is going to have a detrimental effect on the nearby property owner, I think, is exactly what the Code of Virginia says that we should take into consideration. To your point, I do agree that the number of people that benefit from this project, uh, as far as the balance of the scale is concerned, makes it very, very difficult. I understand totally uh, what benefits the YMCA provides to the kids and to the adults and the people. It's a wonderful organization. That, and, and also, the other last point is, you're right, Mr. Ashby came up here and asked for time. There is, if six months goes by and we continue this, six or seven months, this is not an endorsement from my perspective that will be in any way trying to drive the point that the YMCA compensates anyone for anything, period. My only concern is that there is time for dialogue and if it's time for them to disagree even more when they come here the, the next time, so be it. That's our job to take care of those conflicts. But uh, that I did not and will not uh, acquiesce to the fact that that's what this is an endorsement of, period. So that being said, the matter is before the commission for action. And I'll be calling the roll because I know we've got some different outlooks. Mr. Zedrin. I move that we continue this matter to the, the September meeting and also direct staff uh, to work with the DEMS in reference to uh, looking at the SAV matter and see if we can uh, uh, protect uh, as much of that as possible. Uh, and that's my motion. And I second that. It's a second motion made by Mr. Zedrin to continue to September, September 20th, seconded by Mr. Minor. Further discussion? Mr. France? Aye. Mr. Tankard? Aye. Mr. Zedrin? Aye. Dr. Neal? Aye. Mr. Ballard? No. Mr. Minor? Aye. Ms. Lusk? Aye. Ms. Everett's absent. Chair votes aye. Motion passes to continue. Thank you very much for our discussion and very, very good presentations on both sides. It makes things a lot easier for us. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is Bennett's Creek Landing Homeowners Association 181986. Ms. Peabody? All right, good morning. Good morning. Bennett's Creek Landing Homeowners Association is here uh, requesting authorization to remove a previously commission imposed boat lift height restriction um, on the boat lifts at their marina uh, to protect the marina boats during high water events at the Bennett's Creek Landing Homeowners Association Community Marina situated along Bennett's Creek at 106 Club Road in Suffolk. Um, the community marina is located just about a half a mile downstream of the confluence of Bennett's Creek and Nansman River. This is a 19 slip community marina that's managed by the Homeowners Association and the Slip Owners Association. You can see here. It was originally permitted by the VMRC in 1993 and then received um, three additional permits to add boat lifts um, between 93 and 2000. Um, in 2000, the application for the boat lifts was objected to by the adjacent property owners. As a result, the uh, project came to the commission. Um, and at that commission meeting, um, the adjacent property owners were concerned about uh, view shed, but also um, the ability to see when exiting their private pier, specifically Mr. Evans, 
Um, if the boats were lifted, his concerns were about safety to enter the um, channel here. So after the commission heard the um, discussions for and against the project, they came up with a compromise. And that compromise was that the boats could not be lifted any higher than the existing elevation of the pier. Um, over those 20 years, the marina has found that there has been some safety issues associated with that compromise height. So some what issues, ma'am? Some safety Thank issues. Thank you. I didn't um, so here are some pictures. These are, the, um, these are the boats at the existing lifts, um, lifted at about the um, approximate height of the pier. And here's a picture of the marina. In 2000, uh, I'm sorry, last year in 2018, the marina came back and applied to add lifts to any of the slips that did not have them already. Um, and during that process, we did a standard public interest review. The letters went out to the neighbors and the same neighbors continued to, to object to the project if that condition did not remain. So as a result of um, several months of discussions, the Homeowners Association said, although we would like to remove it, we're, we will keep the, um, the boat lift height condition on this permit. And the Marine Association was advised that if they so wish to remove that height restriction, um, they would need to go to the commission. So here's a view looking at the uh, Mr. Evans property from the marina, which is downstream. How far? Ooh, um, 100 feet. And perhaps he could clarify that a little bit. I would say 100 feet. Um, and then upstream at Mr. Scott's uh, private pier. So the issues that the marina um, are stating is that the existing pier is about five feet above mean low water, above low tide. And that throughout the year, uh, when they get excessive uh, high tide events, um, they are unable to, they have so many people at the marina and they do not have a marina manager that in a short amount of time, they're having trouble getting people out to their slips to either remove their boats or raise their boats. Um, and in addition, with sea level rise and, and um, existing trends of uh, high tides getting higher, they foresee this becoming a problem in the future. Um, some people have, have two homes and aren't here during storm seasons, and there's not someone here that can go lift their boat uh, to a higher elevation um, if they're gone. And as a result, they have reported that they've um, had some issues um, associated with their private vessels and their slips. Um, they have a marina a website that shows additional pictures. They're trying to educate their slip owners on what they can do in order to prevent these things. But um, one of their requests is that they are able to store their boats at a higher elevation at all times so that if a person isn't able to get their slip and raise their boat, uh, it won't float away or uh, float off at least. So. Uh, some existing piles are shorter than um, what they are proposing. So <laughs> existing piles, they may achieve about three feet higher um, if lifted to the maximum. New piles may get about an additional six feet of elevation um, if lifted to the maximum, depending on the size of the vessel. Um, so Mr. Evans and Mr. Scott um, have objected to the height lift restrictions specifically. They are here to um, discuss those objections. And again, it's um, safety of getting their vessels away from their peers and the, the block in the view um, as they're trying to navigate. So the Code of Virginia states that the commission shall consider, in addition to other facts, the public and private benefits of the proposed project and its effect on other reasonable and permissi permissible uses of state water and state on bottom lands, and its effects on adjacent or nearby pro properties. The commun community marina is located along a relatively narrow waterway, and the existing boat lifts, as they are, do impact visibility when attempting to access the channel from the adjacent properties. While staff is sensitive to these concerns of the neighbors, it does appear that lifting the boats an additional four to six feet will actually have a greater impact uh, on navigation however, will not have a greater impact on navigation. However, giving the slip owners additional ability to prepare for storms or to store their vessels at a higher elevation 
will significantly, significantly increase safety of the marina and the slip owners there. Accordingly, staff recommends removing the height restriction <laughs> condition for all lifts at the Bennett's Creek Landing Marina. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions for Ms. Peabody by members of the commission? Mr. Ballard. Uh, how many times would you say these boats need to be raised above the agreed height? Is this a once a year hurricane or is this a 15 times a year major high tide event? This is a major high tide event. So probably four to five times a year that these need to be lifted. Further questions? Mr. Ballard, I'm sorry. Yes, sir, Mr. Tankard. This maybe this is the first time I've ever seen a commission commission imposed boat lift height restriction. You weren't on the commission at the time. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's been on the commission forever. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he just missed this one. So maybe a little background on why, uh, besides what we've had in the narrative. Uh, um. I guess since I was sitting out there in 2000 and probably watched every one of them. Matter of fact, I counted up how many I chaired last night. I'm up to 94. But uh, other folks have got many more than that. But, uh, you know, we, we sit here from time to time and we try to make, you know, compromises and try to make everybody happy or whatever at the same time. I think in likelihood, and this is very complimentary in nature, is that's probably where this uh, decision came from and try to, uh, as, as former commissioner used to say, cut the baby in half and satisfy everybody. Right. And that's, I think, and I mean that in a positive manner. There were, it, there was a lot of times a desire to compromise and make everybody feel good when they left out of here. If somebody got their, their boat lift, somebody got their restriction, right, wrong, or indifferent. That's only anecdotal and based on what I have seen, I don't know this specific, I don't remember the specific case, but that's the only thing that I can surmise as to why this, because you're, you're exactly right, Ms. Peabody and I discussed this prior, just in general, as far as going over the agenda. I've never seen this type of condition mm -hmm. before, nor do I know, hey, I guess we can do anything that doesn't violate the code, but I've never seen one like this before. Well, thank you. It does sort of historically it makes sense. We yeah. often like to cut the baby in half yeah. if we have to. Lungs doesn't scream too much. Anyway, um, <laughs> further questions? Thank you, ma'am. Is, is there anyone here from the Marina Association that wishes to be heard? Yes, sir. <laughs> sir, will you be the only one testifying from the Marina Association? Will anybody else be testifying? I'm not sure. I told Scott that if, if I screwed up, he can come up here and fix it. Raise your right hand. We'll see. <laughs> you solemnly swear the testimony you give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God. Yes, sir. Can you please state your name for the record? Uh, my name is Jim Pittman. I moved into Bennett's Creek Landing in 1991. In 1996, I purchased a slip license. Uh, so, been there almost 30 years, long-term member of the uh, marina, long-term resident. Uh, if, I, if I just may, uh, there are four other people here who are slip licensees and residents. In order to be a slip licensee, you must own a home <coughs> at Bennett's Creek Landing. So, Dan Strom, Buck Tyser, Scott Wilson, Pete Toomer, they're all here. Okay. Uh, and, and in support, I presume? Uh, yes, I think. Okay. Yep, yep. In Just for the record, yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I'm going to talk a lot about history. I'm, I'm very glad you brought up about what happened in the year 2000 because I was here, I spoke. I'm still trying to figure out what happened in the year 2000. <laughs> but but <coughs> there is something very important, and and Rachel touched on this safety problem. And so part of this is, and it's very important, is what did we understand in the year 2000 and what do we understand now? Okay. And so I'm gonna to try to talk through this. And um, okay, so the marina, as has been stated, was completed in 1994. It was built by Town Point Associates, which is the developer of our neighborhood. 18 slips. And, and Rachel mentioned there's no manager, so there's no professional staff. This is community people taking care of their slips and taking care of each other. And there's, there's 18 uh, slips there, okay? So 1996 was an important year because that was the year that the, the developer, Town Point Associates, said, okay, there's enough folks 
in Bennett's Creek Landing now to run their homeowners association. So they tra Town Point Associates transferred all the property, the marina, the clubhouse, the pool, to the homeowners. And then the homeowners stood up, elected a board, and we started to run the, the, uh, the association. Uh, so also in 1996, one of the first things we did was we, we put in an application and asked permission to put in six boat lifts at the marina. That was approved without any restrictions, and then three were actually built. Three were actually built in 1996. So in year 2000, we decided we would like for, for everyone to have equal opportunity to put in a boat lift if they so desire. Now several people really did want to do it, but we wanted to just go ahead. Everybody at the, at the marina can have a boat slip. <clears throat> and so we, we turned in uh, the, the JPA, and then the, the adjacent neighbors objected. And so I'll, I'll just speak to those objections uh, briefly. Mr. Scott, um, who purchased his property in December of 1991, and then he built a pier in Bulkhead in 1993, uh, he objected to the impact of the marina on his view. Um, in 1991, I, I have an understanding of what was going on back then because that is the year that my wife and I purchased property. And I can tell you, now the marina doesn't exist, okay? The clubhouse is there, the pool is there, the marina doesn't exist. One of the big sales points uh, was we're going to build a marina in Bennett's Creek. And we heard it, my wife and I heard this several times, and it was basically stated that the uh, marina would be uh, put at the clubhouse, or, or by the clubhouse out you know, at the clubhouse lot. I can only presume that Mr. Scott got the same sales pitch, but I don't know that. I, I don't know if that's true or not. I presume that he did because Boy, we heard it several times. Okay, this is my wife and I. Uh, from, the, from the marina, you can look up and you can see Mr. Scott has a beautiful home up, up on Bennett's Creek. And so I, I'm, I'm having a little trouble with, with the view problem because if, if, if I can imagine myself standing on his uh, deck at his back house, I don't know, he's probably 10 feet or so above the water level. I, I don't know, but he's well above the water level. And if he looks out here to the, to the north, he sees the mouth of Venice Creek, he sees the mouth of the Nansenman, he sees the James River, he sees Newport News, and then he moves over, and I don't know if he so, can sir, see. you're speculating what he may see. I don't think that's appropriate. It's, it, that's, that's what he may see. He, okay. It, it, as a point of law, I, I, I prefer you stay away from what. Okay. He may not be able to see anything if you get right down to it, so I just don't want an assumption made. You can say that you can see from that area what you can see, but yeah, I wouldn't say I just, what he can see. I, I've never been on his property, so okay. I, I, I don't know how to say. No, I, no. I, okay. just in all due respect. So now, what's my point now? Having been shot down, what's my point? Um, all right, so let me do this. If you're standing in back, so the marina's right here, okay. so, south of his house. And what's over there, the view that's being obstructed is a, is a beautiful big marsh. That's what's being obstructed. All right, so, and by the way, Mr. Evans is here. I don't know, is Paul, is Paul Scott here? No. Okay. Mr. Evans is here, so I'll, I'm sure if I say something wrong, he'll <laughs> let me know. All right, so uh, Mr. Evans and the adjacent neighbor also objected. Uh, so, so let's go back through the timeline. The, the marina is built in 1994. In 1996, this organization approved the, the, the uh, installation of six slips at the marina. Three were actually put in. Mr. Evans purchased his property in February 1997. So the marina's there, three boat lifts are there, and he says that if we put more boat lifts in, he thinks it'll hurt his property values. I, I, I have a hard time with that because those slips, uh, Can I, did, sir, did he say that to you as far as the value was concerned? 
Did he say that to you that his property value? No, he gave said it? it. He said it to you, and, he, and it's written in the in the staff report, and it's written in the minutes. Okay, thank and you. I, I'm going to ask. Can you pull up a chart for me? I'm a Mac guy. I don't know what to do with a piece layout. You know. That's why I've got all these smart folks around here. You get my my chart from the uh, uh, satellite. Yeah. And, and, sir, in all due respect, I don't mean to cut you short, but I think what we should be doing is narrowing the focus as to why you think that the height restriction should, should be uh, eliminated or removed from the condition. I really, what happened back then and what happened at, at, as, as a point of order, I don't think it really is, although it may be important to you from a historical perspective, but as far as the commission is concerned, we're deciding today whether or not to remove the restriction and why we should or should not remove the restriction. What happened in 96, I think, is irrelevant to the point that we're discussing or being concerned with today. And I, I mean that in all due respect. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Yes, sir. So I am addressing an objection that, that Mr. Evans made in year 2000, and he made the same objection again in year 2020. Okay. Does, does that help? It does. Okay. So we know we know, we know he objects to that. That's why we're yeah. Here. I'm just saying it, the objection has occurred 20 years apart, and you know, he he bought property next to a marina that has boat slips, but he says a few more boat slips will hurt his property value. Okay. Right. Um, and of course he like he, he will straighten me out in a few minutes. Uh, the more serious issue is year 2000. He he talked about a navigational hazard. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I asked Rachel to put this up is here's, here's a satellite photo. And at the bottom, you can see a very large boat. Mr. Evans has a 37-foot boat. And you can see it here uh, at the bottom. And this, ah, OK, there it is. All right. So there's Mr. Evans' boat and his pier. Here's the marina. OK. So you can see what the sight line is. So you, can, or you can kind of imagine. And yeah, when you look back, yeah, there is some blocking of the view uh, from his boat lift looking back from the marina. Okay. So, yeah, so it's there, but the staff in the year 2000 said basically that it's not serious enough to rise to the level of a navigation hazard. Now, these are my words, but the staff report is there. You can read exactly what they said. You can also see Mr. Scott's house or pier. This is Mr. Scott's pier right here. So you can see, well, I mean, you can see the situation there. Okay. So, and I, I do think it's important just to say in the, in the year 2000, Mr. Evans approached the marina and said, I've got this concern about navigational issues, navigational hazards, and it's the two slips on the, on the very end here that concern me. So it's, it's these two boats right here, and you can see where his boat is. And so there were some discussions between those folks about, okay, maybe we could lower the, the uh, boat lifts a little bit to help you out. But apparently they were not able to come to an agree, agreement that was satisfactory. Therefore, uh, Mr. Evans objected as the adjacent neighbor. He objected in the year 2000. And so basically what was said, uh, what was decided by this group was, okay, let's go ahead and let's approve the slips, but we'll put on this restriction that Mr. Evans re requested, which is that the, the boat lifts can only be raised as high as the main pier. It's the, it's the bottom crossbar of the slip of the boat lift to the main pier, okay? All right, so th this is a, this is a, this is a little bit ironic, and this is why it's important to, to ask yourself, what did you know in year 2000? Okay, so in order to split the baby, maybe, however that decision was made, uh, the boat lifts were approved with the restriction, but in the attempt to, to give the objecting homeowner the benefit of the doubt about the safety issue, this commission inadvertently created a new safety issue by putting that restriction on there. Okay, so the logic is that in the year 2000, I don't remember what I knew about sea level rise. 
in the year 2000, I don't remember what I knew about hurricane and, and other storm intensification. Now, 20 years later, we have a great deal of evidence that says this is a big, big problem. And I do remember back in the year 2000, a number of people at the marina were kind of upset about this decision. And I do remember people saying, the pier that they made in 1994 is really not high enough. It should have been a foot higher. There were people talking about, you know, the water getting so high and it was kind of a little bit scary at times. And um, so what has happened in 20 years? In 20 years, people are now very much aware of sea level rise, especially in our area. And you hear it on the news about problems in Virginia Beach and Norfolk, et cetera, et cetera. So we are now getting flooding, and Rachel did make this point, I think she said four to five times, you know, something like six times a year. So we are now getting flooding of the main pier approximately six times a year, typically. And we're only, our pier is only two foot, three inches above mean high water. And so we're getting these flooding instances frequently. And once again, we're not professionals, so we don't keep good records. We tend to go with anecdotal. And I've asked people, well, how many times did it flood in 96, et cetera? And it's like, well, we don't know, a little bit. Are the floods higher? Well, yes, they are higher because we had to replace all of our pedestals. On electrical pedestals, we had to replace all of them because we stepped, started getting these flooding problems and the pedestals got shorted out. So now we've got new pedestals where they've got a, a, a one foot uh, s support to, to help protect them. So, uh, so we, we have lost apparently something like four to five inches uh, due to sea level rise in terms of our safety margin, okay? Sea level rise is accelerating. In this area, it's now running one inch every four years. And so sea level rise will never stop. For the, for the rest of our lives, sea level rise will continue. There's not a single person here who will ever see this stop, okay? So every year, the problem is gonna get worse and worse and worse. There's also the issue of storm intensification. The storms are just getting nastier. And it, it's, you can't predict this stuff, but this is what the, the experts say. And so we're gonna to continue to have these problems and they will just get worse. So when you put a restriction on these boats like this, once again, there's no professionals. You've got people who are homeowners. They work hard, they work long, they go out of town, they travel for work. They take the kids and stuff, and they can't always be on top of things like they should. Plus the fact most of the people who, who have a slip, they can't see the water, and they can't see the, the marina. And so they have to make special trips down here to check. And you know, when is it okay for me to move my, thing, move my, uh, move my boat up? So we are in what is now a bona fide safety situation that is artificial because of a decision made by this group in the year 2000. Now, what I'll say is, I still don't think, I mean, maybe you guys did. I just think collectively, 20 years ago, we didn't understand these things, but we do understand them now. And so, I mean, basically today, we're saying, please help us out. Please remove this safety problem, or at least as much as you can, because I mean, there's a point where of no return. There's a point where we can't do anything. But this is an artificial uh, restriction that has caused a safety problem uh, to people's, people's property. And, and so there's just no reason for it. There, there's just no justification for it, okay? And so we're simply saying, would you please take this restriction away so we can have more freedom and we can do a better job of protecting our property? It's, just as simple as that. Understand the point. Questions of the gentleman? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, sir. I've got a question for the board. Uh, we don't, sir, we don't answer questions. If you have a question for staff, we, uh, you, you, we, this board does not answer questions in that, in that form from that perspective. If you want to come up and state your question, I can ask staff, possibly, but, but come forward. 
And we certainly don't respond to them from the audience. Sir, could you raise your right hand? Yes, sir. Do you solemnly swear the testimony that you give me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes, sir. Thank you. Can you state your name, please? Buck Ty uh, Well, Clyde Tyson. Mr. Tyson, please proceed. I, I want to ask you, how many marinas or how many uh, uh, stipulations have y'all got on boat lifts in the rest of the state of Virginia? The answer would be I have no idea. As far as, the, as far as this specific stipulation, we've got a lot of stipulations that we put in based on conditions and things like that. That I couldn't answer that question if I tried. Okay. It's a lot, and they're different. Yes, sir. Anyone else in support of this matter? Anyone in opposition to this matter? Yes, sir, could you come forward, please? Good afternoon. George, right hand. So I'm just going to testify you give me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. I do. You state your name, please. John Evans. Mr. Evans. Evans. Good to have you here. Four. Proceed, please. 104 Club Road, Suffolk. Uh, I'm the southernmost or uh, southern immediate property owner to you see the boat on the bottom. Yes, sir. Uh, as much as I hate to start off like this, this, this is history. <laughs> and I need to go back 20 years like uh, Mr. Pittman did. This really started, they said the, the it, it, Mr. Pittman is right in a lot of what he said. There were three boat lifts in the marina when I bought my property. At some point later, in, in, as time passed on, another person would apply. And of course, the adjacent property owner gets to, you know, you have to get sign off. And so they would come to me and I would talk with them and they would go to Paul Scott and he would talk with them. Some of the conversation was, well, where are you going to keep your boat? And so we had the opportunity to meet and greet and present our con concerns to the individuals when they wanted to put a lift in. Mm -hmm. Well, at some point they got tired of doing that and they said, well, let's get the whole Blaine Marina permitted. That took my opportunity away to talk to the individuals. The whole thing's permitted. They'll put them in when they want, how they want. So we came over to the meeting 20 years ago and the whole marina was permitted for lifts and I posed my normal I, I have this concern about my boat, which at that time was a 37-foot boat. Now the one you're seeing there is a 53. I actually just sold it. I'm moving back down. Uh, there is a, I didn't bring pictures today. There is a visibility issue getting out of that slip. Uh, my next boat will probably not be in that slip. It'll be perpendicular closer to the marina as it stands, pointing in towards my, my house, which means I'd be backing out of that slip, which is where I was in those days. Uh, during the meeting, I posed my question of safety, and the board did come up, so well, what about, I said, you know, I'm on the bridge of my boat. It's a, it was a 37-foot boat, and if the boats are down some, I can have, have a better vision of boats entering the creek. Uh, so one of the board members said, what if we put a height restriction on work for me it's worked for 20 years i saw the pictures they saw it uh, they showed today I'd, I'd make two comments on the pictures i also have a picture of the boat it's nose down sitting on the dock and at that point that lift was not risen to its to its extreme height and that that particular lift has got the taller post on it i've never had an objection i've never objected to anybody uh to raising boats during high tide situations. I would even, it, it sort of surprised me that, that the board didn't ask at that time, well, what about storm times? And I would have easily said, well, in a storm time, I'm a boater, let's, let's get them up out of the water best we can. And I'd also say to that, they, they are complaining about having to come down and take care of that boat in a storm. Storm tides are really, really predictable these days. We know when they're coming. This is a community of people on that pier over there. Getting a lift up is a matter of getting there and flipping a switch, and maybe flipping your neighbor's switch too. <coughs> I, I personally don't see that as, as a real hardship for me. You know, boat ownership comes with consequences. Uh, that's about all I got to say about it. It was, it, it was a, it was a board proposed compromise that I believe has worked for 20 years. Uh, 
to, to, to take that compromise away now says, tells me that the board believes that there's something has changed. Is it any safer now? That's why it was put in. Have the owners, have the slip holders put, made any changes to make it any safer for me as an adjacent property owner? I don't see it. If you do, you'll have to vote that way. I thank you for thank your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your presentation. Mr. Zedrin has a question, sir? Oh, I, sure. I have a question for you. Are the lifts as they are now <coughs> capable of, when a storm comes, them ra raising their boat higher, or do they have to put a different pile in or bigger lifts or what? I know that the first three, the first couple of three were put in with, with taller pilings. I honestly don't know about the rest of them. Okay. Uh, let me follow, follow up. Sir. All right. So if, if, the, if we took, in, instead of doing away with the restrictions, modified the restrictions to say that on uh, times of high water, high tide, or something like that, that the uh, slip owners can raise their thing? Absolutely. Like I said, I've never objected to that. I, I'm a boater's boater. Okay. Thanks. Oh, yeah, we've got some questions, Mr. Tankard. Yeah, so the safety, I'm having a hard time understanding the safety issue here. You're going to have to help me with this. Okay. It's, it's just coming and going out of my slip. If you'll see, my view is blocked somewhat, not as much where the boat sits right now, but where I did move, keep the other boat it was, backing out into traffic. Now, I'll tell you another thing that has changed on Bennett's Creek in the last 20 years. It's probably about three times the boat usage and maybe 10 times the large boat usage since the marina and, and uh, restaurant opened up up the creek from us. We've even had airplanes routinely come in. So it's, I'd say the safety issue, it's a, it's a lot greater deal from my perspective than it was then. And Just to tell your follow up. So, so that you're backing into a channel where people yes. are moving rapidly. Yes, it is a no wake zone, but yeah. like I said in 2000, kind of if I back into a boat out there, I know whose fault it's gonna be. Mr. French, you have a question, sir? Uh, Mr. Tankard kind of asked it for me, but uh, there is a no wake zone in this area? It is. Yeah. It is. Okay. Yes. Questions? I got a, a couple things. Number one, I am not going to chastise by any means impugn the decision making that would occurred in 2000, but I have a hard time with that condition as far as it being really, really, number one, enforceable. Who's going to enforce the specificity of what's going on as far as the height of the boat's concerned and things like that? The other thing I have a concern is, you know, we mentioned the fact that you can go, you know, and, and, and I understand that in my neighborhood it would be no problem as far as you flipping your neighbor's switch. However, I had one time when my neighbor flipped my switch and didn't understand how the boat lift ran and it ran the thing right up through the roof. So you're faced with that potential liability as well. The last thing, sir, and all due respect, your boat, where it's positioned, if someone were to come and put a dock to the bottom of, and I don't know which direction that is because I can't see the orientation, wouldn't it be true if it were to the bottom and shoreward of there, they would have the same concern as you have as far as the other boats are concerned, as far as safety? The bottom meaning bottom below my Oh, that slide. Yes, sir. I can't tell what there, you're... There's marsh there. It's all there's, marsh. Yeah, there, the next opportunity to put a, a boat, slip, uh, pier, anything, has already been taken up by the people in the adjacent neighborhood. Which direction does that... Uh, if you're standing, um, I guess on this, your boat's backed in, correct? No. No, my boat sits parallel with the with the channel the way it is right now. I think it, Rachel's actually got a better picture. Of no, I don't. I don't need it. But okay. if you're standing on the end of your pier, <laughs> and you're looking to what would be the left toward those boats? Yes. What direction is that? I'm looking north. Looking north. Yes. Okay. Uh, out of the creek to the mouth okay. of the creek. Yes. And to the point as far as storm tides are concerned. I live on Cypress Creek in Smithfield, which is a tributary yeah. of the Pagan. Mm -hmm. I, I know what kind of tides we're confronted with as well. They And sometimes you can predict them, and sometimes you get up in the morning and you look out, and you're like, well, where did that come from? Um, so I have some sympathy with that. H having lived there 20 years, I'll tell you quite frankly, my peer is my dock, main dock, is eight inches taller than the one next door. Mm -hmm. I see my dock go underwater maybe every other year. You're lucky. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I yeah, am. Maybe, the, and the eight inches does make a big difference. I'll yeah. tell you that. Yeah. Uh, when, when, when it was, when my dock was built, it was immediately after what we call the twin nor'easters, where those, the dock next door went barely under two weekends in a row. So. I just. I, and I'll just, I understand where you're coming from. I understand where both of the, of the other folks are coming from. I just, I mean, it's just, 
when you're starting to enforce a condition such as that it, from a lawful perspective, and like, that makes it, you know, who's going to take the level out? Who's going to, when, like when you make law, you're supposed to be able to be clear, concise, and be able to enforce it. And this one causes me just a little heartburn. That being said, any further questions? The matter's before the commission for action. Thank you, sir. I move that we approve staff recommendations. Motion made by Mr. Minor to approve staff recommendations. Or second? I'll second. Second by Dr. Neal. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. We're going to break for lunch here, but what I will do is, is there anyone in the audience from a public comment perspective that wishes to be heard on public comments that are not on the agenda. We'll also have public comments after this as well. Thank you. Thank you. We'll break for lunch and we'll be back somewhere uh, just shortly after quarter of one.